Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and let me first start by apologizing for the delay. We are running a bit behind. Today, on the occasion of the 45th anniversary of Black Wednesday, the National Press Club, in partnership with UNISA and the Goboza family, welcomed you to the annual Pacific Goboza Memorial Lecture, which is in its 12th year. Um, before I do a couple of uh, house rules, I would like to request everyone if we can just rise on our feet to observe a moment of silence. 
a moment of silence for our late general manager and chairperson, Mr. Jos Charlie. He was also a key member of the team that has been responsible for making this particular memorial lecture possible. His passing left a void in the journalism profession in the country. He may be gone, but certainly not forgotten. Thank you. <clears throat> so this is the day on which media freedom activists, journalists, freedom of expression advocates, constitutionalists and democracy respecting people in the country will celebrate media freedom and commemorate Black Wednesday's anniversary. My name is Musidi Mohele and I have the honor of directing proceedings for today. Just a few house rules, the restrooms uh, on your left, as soon as you come out of the door, on your left. And UNISA has been generous to allow us to use their Wi-Fi. So we are hoping that you will keep the conversation going on social media under the hashtags Koboza Lecture and also hashtag Black Wednesday. You are welcome to tag the National Press Club on Twitter. Our handle or uh, Twitter account is at NP Club and also UNISA at, at UNISA. So without any further ado, I would like to call upon Professor Siasanga Jiali, who is the acting director for the School of Arts, to officially welcome us to the University of the Land. Thank you, um, Program Director. Uh, Ms. Mosidi Mohele, um, General Manager of the National Press Club. Um, good morning, uh, Mr. Premier, um, and other important uh, dignitaries that are here with us uh, this morning. Perhaps I should mention um, that this year's lecture coincides with quite a number of uh, events that are happening within the university. Uh, we would know that uh, <clears throat> there's about uh, quite a number of graduations. We are in a graduation season. Um, there are also uh, the exam sessions that are unfolding, as well as other stakeholder engagement meetings that are taking place today. And so ordinarily, Mr. Premier and dignitaries, you would all have been uh, welcomed uh, by the institutional head, that is uh, Professor Lengabula, our VC, or the college head, that is Professor Zetungosi, uh, who is the executive dean of the College of Human Sciences. But as I indicated, both of these colleagues have been held elsewhere, and so they do send their apologies. And so on behalf of the executive dean, within the College of Human Sciences, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all the attendees to this year's 12th Percy Koboza Memorial Lecture. <clears throat> that being the case, my line manager, um, that is the dean, has requested that I make mention of the following dignitaries. Uh, that is uh, Mr. Panyaza Lesufi, the Premier of Gauteng, Reverend Mangali Mkachwa, former mayor of the city of Tswane, uh, who is here this morning, or who has sent their representative. The keynote speaker, that is uh, Professor Onkopotse J.J. Tabane, uh, who is an anchor of ENCA's uh, Power to Truth, and an adjunct professor and director of communication and marketing at the UNISA SPL, as well as uh, Professor Msweli, who is the CEO and Executive Dean of the SPL here within the university. I'd also like to recognize Mrs. MZ Letuanyane, who is the wife of the Anglican Bishop of the Diocese of the Free State and their daughter who are present here with us. Mrs. Uh, Ms. Togozile Koboza and her sister, 
who are here with us as well, as well as um, all the members of the Goboza family. Mrs. Antoinette um, Slabert, the chairperson of the National Press Club, uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps uh, that are here with us, with a special mention um, of uh, Mehawit Hadish from the Ethiopian Embassy, um, who is here in South Africa. I also would like to take note of our panelists, uh, that is Hopewell Chinono, uh, one of Southern Africa's most well-known journalists, Boinelo Hadi, a journalist from Botswana, Mole Mutseu, who is a current affairs Twitter Spaces host, and Crystal Anderson, who is a journalist and news editor from the Eyewitness News. I would also like to take note of our partners, that is the National Press Club, colleagues from UNISA's Institutional Advancement, particularly the Executive Director of UNISA's Institutional Advancement, Mrs. Kanya Masare, UNISA community at large, and our most treasured stakeholders, that is UNISA. So please allow me to take this opportunity to welcome you all to this lecture. I am extremely proud to give this welcoming note that comes slightly more than a decade into our partnership with the National Press Club and the Koboza family. We are just emerging from COVID-19 pandemic, and the last two years were, of course, a time when the media sector was facing greater challenges, including issues of job losses within the sector, the closure of publications that have played major advancement in growing the media sector, growing question into South Africa's polarized and politicized journalism practice and innovations driven by research and development within media and technology spaces. And so questions on the state of the media cannot be swept under the carpet as the profession is too important for any democracy. It is on those bases that today's lecture becomes important and timely. This morning we are coming together to listen to South Africa's leading public intellectual, which is Professor J.J. Onkhopot Zetabane, who is addressing us under the theme, Media Freedom in light of the 2022 World Freedom Index points to worrying signs of freedom of expression in Southern Africa with several countries recording sharp declines. And I think that this is a worrying factor for anyone who is interested in any democracy. And so, as I stated, the address is timely, not only because of the significance of the Koboza Memorial Lecture in relation to the 1977 Black Wednesday and media freedom, it is also timely because it allows us to reflect on the gains and losses that have happened within the journalism pr profession in the last 45 years. Of course, who other than the Koboza name could help us in reflecting on the changes that have happened and whether the trade has deviated or not from its core purpose. Widely known as Injem Nyama among his peers, Len Kalani, his former colleague, notes, and I quote, Koboza had almost single-handedly charted a new course in black journalism, a new form of black journalism dealing with social and political issues at hand to spur on the struggle against apartheid and injustice. And so the Koboza name is thus important to us as it allows as to reflect on the political question of journalism, journalism's role in the fight for a free and fair, and of course, the trade's continued relevance into social healing and social democracy. Program director, perhaps you can allow me to make a few further comments about the history of this project. It's relevant to Black Wednesday and its association with the Globals family and more particularly Mr. Percy Corboza. Since the inauguration of the annual Percy Corboza Memorial Lecture in 2011, which was commemorating Black Wednesday with the World Newspaper and other newspapers, 
were closed. UNISA and the National Press Club have used the event to shine a spotlight on media matters that affect societies. And so the event was conceived and still remains a focal area of reflecting on journalism behavior, developments in the profession, and thus must represent the spirit of journalism, must be representative of the industry, and must facilitate discussions of relevant and timely media topics. As he was influential black South African media practitioner working under harsh conditions during the apartheid era, Pesikobosa remains a shining example of commitment to the cause of activist journalism. Thus, as a university, we are grateful to the Koboza family for borrowing us the name of Percy Koboza. He remains an important example to our students. And with these few words, program di director, I hereby welcome everyone to this event. Thank you so much. Uh, Prof. Jali, you didn't have to cut short your speech. <laughs> I know I kept looking your way. I was merely checking if our panelists are able to connect. But thank you so much for welcoming us, uh, as you usually say, to the University of the Land. And next on the program, ladies and gentlemen, we have the chairperson of the National Press Club, uh, Ms. Antoinette Slavet, and may I mention that uh, the National Press Club is a body of journalists and communication specialists uh, that has been in existence for 44 years. So if you'd like to join us, I know this is not a marketing slot, but if you would like to join us, please do go to our website and follow us on our social media pages so that you can have the platform to network with like-minded professionals. Uh, Antoinette, uh, over to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Musidi. Um, Premier Lesufi, Professor Tabane, Professor Tiali, um, and then Ms. Tukazili uh, Koboza and Pinky Sefamla, and all other dignitaries. Why are we here today? The Percy uh, Koboza Memorial Lecture, organized by the National Press Club and UNISA, is held annually. In, remember, in remembrance of 19 October 1977, when the apartheid government shut down the world and weakened world newspapers. Over the years, it has become known as Black Wednesday. The National Press Club and UNISA organized the first Percy Corvosa Memorial Lecture in 2011, as uh, Prof said. Now, who was Percy Corvosa? Percy Celiso Peter Koboza was born on 17 January 1938 in Sophia Town. Sophia Town, from where they would have, the family would have been uh, or were forcibly removed by the apartheid government. Um, in 1932, even before he was born, the newspaper Bantu World was established as an opposition newspaper. In 1962, Bantu World became the world, a significant voice in journalism until it was banned. Kuboza worked for the world as a cadet reporter for five years before becoming the news editor of the newspaper. And in 1974, he was appointed the editor. In 1976, he was selected as South Africa's Neiman Fellow at Harvard University. He was also the recipient of the Golden Pen Freedom Award from the International Publishers Association and the South African Society of Journalists Pringle Award. The ruling party saw the world as its enemy and in December 1976, Kuboza was taken in for questioning about the newspaper's reporting of the 16 June 1976 Soweto uprisings. He was released 18 hours later, but was arrested again after a few months. On 19 October 1977, a year later, Percy Koboza and colleague Agri Claster were arrested and sent to prison. Government shut down the world and the weekend world newspapers. On the same day, 18 black organizations were banned. Koboza was in jail for six months without being formally charged 
and without a court hearing, as was done at that stage under the emergency um, legislation. Following his release, Koboza became editor of the Post. The Post and the Sunday Post were launched to replace the world and the weekend world. In 1980, these new newspapers were closed by the government in Koboza's absence as he was working in Washington for the Washington Post at that stage. He returned to South Africa after nine months and worked as a public relations consultant until 1984 when he became the associate editor of City Press. And in 1985, he was appointed as the editor of City Press, where he remained until his death on his 50th birthday in 1988. Over the years, we've had eminent persons as guest, uh, guest speakers or keynote speakers um, at this event. Uh, these include Professor Kobus van Rooyen, activist Jay Naidu, um, stalwart of the journalism industry, Joe Clawlwe, Mondli Makanya, Mushwishwe Munare, Kevin Ritchie, Vusi Koboza, Father Smangalisu Makachwa, and Dr. Somadoda Fekeni. We hold this lecture in the remembrance of Percy Koboza and those who fought and sacrificed with him for the media freedom we enjoy today. We hold this lecture so that it never happens again. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Antoinette, for giving us uh, an overview of Ntate Pesi Koboza's legacy in as far as the memorial lecture is concerned. Before I call upon Metogo Koboza, who is the daughter of the late Ntate Koboza, I would just like to acknowledge her sister, who's here with us as well. Maybe in his Pamela, if you can just wave to the audience. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we are truly grateful as, uh, un on, on behalf of UNISA and the National Press Club that uh, the Koboza family um, has allowed us and granted us permission to continue hosting this lecture in remembrance of Ndate Pesi Koboza. So Meto Go Koboza, please um, come to the front. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The Koboza family is humbled and honored that you have taken time out of your busy schedules to gather here with us to attend the 12th Pesci Koboza Memorial Lecture in remembrance of Black Wednesday. Thank you to Mr. Panyaza Lusufi for your presence, the Premier of Gauteng, to Professor Onkhoputi J.J. Dabane, whom we are looking forward to hearing what his views are about where we are in regards to press freedom, and um, the panelists as well. We are looking forward to hearing their stories and their experiences um, in order for us to learn and to know where we are as a people with regards to press freedom. Uh, to our family that have walked this journey with us for 12 years, the Press Club, who are the organizers of this event, Thank you as well to UNISA, the home of the PQ Memorial Lecture. We appreciate you and are indebted to you always. Who was Pesci Koboza? Pesci Koboza was an avid author, journalist, and activist. He was a symbol and champion of the fight for press freedom. He was relentless, apologetic, fearless in fighting for this cause. In 1981, 
my father wrote an article aimed at the white readers, and I quote, if you have sometimes, if you sometimes get mad at me because the, of the sentiments I express and that they keep you awake at night, then I am glad. I do not see why I should bear the brunt of insomnia worrying about what will happen tomorrow. If many of us can keep awake at night, then maybe we will do the sensible thing, talk together about our future. This was my father's dream, that we can talk together about our future. So this was very disturbing when I looked at the report that the World Press Index um, showed where we are exactly with regards to press freedom. I know my father would have been very sad. My father would have been very disappointed that some sectors of the media have allowed themselves to be used by political factions to confuse, polarize, and divide people of this country. The 2022 World Freedom Index report would no doubt have concerned him that we are regressing in our vigilance in guarding the press freedom. This press freedom, especially for this country, we have to guard it jealously. We know what it has done for us. The press for us is another tool that has, has fought during apartheid. It has fought alongside with other sections of the communities uh, to make sure that we overcome apartheid. So I strongly believe and my family believes that we have to fight for this press freedom to make sure that we never lose what the gains of the past. So I thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and I look forward to the presentations so that we can hear where we're going with the press freedom and what we can do. And to quote my father, let's not sleep at night if there are things that are not making us, you know, peaceful. So, and the report that we saw is actually telling us the story that maybe we should be vigilant once again and, for, and fight hard for press freedom. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Metogo Koboza, uh, for those words which um, our panelists will help us reflect on. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, our guest as well will, will touch a bit more on that and expand. But at this point in time, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to introduce to you the Premier of Houghton Province, Ndate Panyaza Lisufi. But before he comes up, uh, for those of you who might have been following the press club, as far back as 10 years ago, uh, Premier Lisuf was the spokesperson for the Department of Basic Education, and we recognized him for being the media liaison person of the year for 2012. <laughs> so I'm sure as someone who has walked uh, this journey with us. We're looking forward to a much more meaningful relationship with his office. And uh, Dadeli Sufi, please address us sir. Uh, thank you so much, Program Director. Actually, that's the cap I wanted to wear when I was uh, making my reservation, uh, JJ to attend this function. I didn't want to attend as a premier. Uh, I wanted to attend as a media activist. Um, but unfortunately, my reservations was changed to be the premier. Now that's why 
I'm addressing you. I thought I'll freely express my views, uh, the very strong views uh, on various matters that uh, are currently confronting us. I hope even when I address them in my capacity as the Premier of the province, you'll understand why. The entire leadership of uh, UNISA, uh, represented here by Professor Charlie, thank you so much for the hospitality uh, and everything that uh, you have provided. Uh, JJ Tabani, Prof. Uh, it's very difficult to say a Prof. JJ, but thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> we have shared many battles uh, uh, and many other things. Mefan Zail Slabet, thank you so much. Uh, the family of Ntate uh, Pesiko Boza, represented here by Sis Togo and Auspinki. Uh, I'm told that uh, Father Mkashwa is here as well, uh, the former mayor of the city, uh, and the entire leadership and honorable guests there that are here. As I said, I made uh, uh, my reservations to come and attend this function because I personally observed the day. Uh, as a media activist, uh, but also I really feel government has abandoned a very important day, uh, if I'm not mistaken, maybe I'm the only senior government official that is in this gathering. Uh, and it's like Marikan, I always ask myself when we commemorate Marikan, that you don't see government ministers, government officials attending the day or observing the day. Uh, there are things that you might not like, but uh, I always felt uh, that the presence of government uh, must always be there so that we can learn, we can also accept criticism, and we can also be in a position to make contributions on platforms uh, that have been created. So I'm here to observe the day and also to congratulate uh, the National Press Club for, for the event, and uh, hopefully uh, this lecture will also contribute to the debate on how the media is conducting itself in our country. I'm of the strong view that there is a, a huge storm that is brewing uh, within the fourth estate. Uh, and I hope um, when uh, JJ is going through his presentation, uh, will not escape uh, uh, this storm that is brewing. I think all of us agree to the issue of accountability, that we must be accountable. And I hope uh, the fourth estate will not escape the need to also account uh, and attend to issues that affect that sector. One, it's an interesting battle between News24 and the independent media. Uh, uh, that, that battle, uh, it's going unabated. It's a serious battle. Uh, it has taken a posture of associating itself with the ruling party factional battles. And I'm glad, Sister, uh, you raised the, that part. Uh, I know when I read a story of News24, it will be perceived to be a story about the CR formations. And when I read something within the independent media, it will be perceived to be RET forces. And we have to ask ourselves, is our media in that, uh, uh, engaging in that space to inform us or to take or align themselves with the factional politics within the ANC? But one thing that shocked me, and it's still something that I don't understand how it escaped the media, no one wants to take responsibility for it. Um, and I'm, I'm really sorry <clears throat> uh, that, um, uh, uh, Christian, uh, you will not fight me, uh, that you, you, you had a journalist uh, that was standing for political office but covering politics. Um, you had a certain Edwin in city who was covering our president during elections when he was contesting the same elections uh, for a certain political party. Uh, and one media house just said, sorry, we're not aware. But when you publish, IEC published a list uh, of journalists or of people that are contesting office, the journalist's name was there. Uh, actually, there was one radio station where a certain political party was formed on the platform of that radio station. So I'm of the view that uh, even though we speak about accountability, I'm I'm one of those that are jealous about this fourth estate. Uh, that its independence must stand firm. Uh, its independence must be supported. Its independence must not only be perceived, but it must be seen uh, that they are indeed independent and that they will be in a position to guide society. Because if the fourth estate fails to do that, uh, I can assure you uh, we are in trouble. 
when you say you are fearless, when you say you want to hold those in power accountable, uh, let it be seen through your lenses, let it be seen through your pages, let it be seen through your voices, so that we can believe in you and you can assist us uh, to ensure that our democracy indeed prospers. So this particular day is very crucial, and I'm glad it has been created, uh, that we take stock across all lines, across all sides. We take stock uh, uh, honestly and openly, uh, so that in whatever that we do, our bona fide cannot be questioned uh, or, 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 or be challenged. Um, I always argue to say, when you appoint the board of the SABC, um, uh, Prof. J.J. Dawan, everyone is up in arms. Yeah. Everyone wants everyone to be in that particular board. Then when we appoint the board of ICASA, which is the overall board that manage the media industry in our country. People don't even care who's there. You can't even quote who's a member of that particular board. It's either it's weak or it does not understand it mandates or it become a technocrat. Uh, it wants to manage the signals only, not the mandate of ensuring that our media houses are in order. And um, I hope there will be a ceasefire between News24 and Independent because I don't know who will intervene and be a referee but I remain hopeful that the media itself will be a referee. I want to wish you well, uh, JJ, for the, looking forward to your input, and thank the Press Club for, for this event and the panelists that are going to be part of this particular event. Thank you so much, Program Director. <laughs>
Yeah, thank you, Musidi, um, for the warm uh, introduction. Uh, Premier, Banyaza Lesufi, thank you so much for being here. Um, as he's talk about Koboza and the Koboza family, uh, May uh, Fanzail Slaber, thank you so much as well. Professor Jali, thank you for, for, for inviting me along with the press club. And of course, Professor Musueli, my, my dynamic boss, I have to pay the bills here and sing for my supper here to say welcome also, <laughs> Professor. Just to say a few words about uh, Panyaza Lesuf, Panyaza, uh, or Premier, you know, I bet you know. <laughs> Congratulations. I, I, I suspect our generation is going to be very proud of what you are about to achieve, because you are proud already with what you have achieved. We always generally criticize government for all sorts of things, because you, 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 give, you, you do too many things that allow us to criticize you. But when somebody does good, we need to also acknowledge and say, there is an example of a civil servant. So please don't let us down, because you know we'll come down on you if you let us down. But I wish you well uh, and in the work that we have to do. It's a singular honor for me to have been asked to deliver this memorial lecture in honor of a legendary editor par excellence, the late Percy Koboza. And through memorializing his legacy, highlight the issues of freedom of the media in our day. You know, on television, I don't have to read the script, you know, but when you're a professor, <laughs> <it's> called, <laughs> and you have to quote a lot of things, <laughs> so please forgive me. <laughs> Freedom of the media is a, is a crucial building block of any growing democracy. According to the Journal of Freedom House, uh, in the article by Sarah uh, Repushi, she states that freedom of the media is in decline the world over. The general argues that the attack on freedom of the media is a, is a symptom of the attack on democracy itself and the breakdown of other institutions that are meant to, 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 to in a sense, support democracy. So in, in a sense, in our country, if you know, institutions such as the public protector are weak, institutions such as the Human Rights Commission never say a word, you know, uh, those are you know, institutions that would even make the media itself not be supported as part of a crucial element of our democracy. Pesit Koboza is a name worth remembering as we, act, uh, uh, as we assess how far we have come uh, given the latter day reality uh, of this kind of breakdown uh, of, of democracy, not just here, but across, across the world. It is so because Pesit Koboza not only pursued the ideals of freedom, but he pursued the ideals of press freedom when it was not fashionable to do so, when it could result in death, when it could result in detention, that it would result in torture. So it's not something that you just wake up and do you know, as, a, as a hobby, but it was very serious in the fight against freedom generally. And so through his various editorial roles, he sort of set, a, a, in, in a sense, a, a trail that all of us uh, have to follow. I mean, paying tribute upon his death in 1998, here are some of the uh, tributes worth repeating and remembering. The president, Derek Bock, uh, from Harvard University said, and I quote, Harvard University grieves at the loss of its Neiman alumnus, counselor and friend. We mourn Percy's death as we rejoiced in his life. South African journalism, which has suffered much, now suffers more. Musha Shomonari, who's now the head of the SABC uh, editorial team, says, said at that time that Koboza told the story of the people. He was always in touch. He lived with them in their communities and was able to witness their pain and their experiences. And he was able to witness their terrible conditions. He was an exemplary journalist, 
that connected with his readers. It's very, very important stuff to emulate. Howard Simons, uh, who's the curator of the Neiman Foundation, said at that time, on behalf of Neimans everywhere and freedom-loving journalists everywhere, we send you and your children our sincerest condolences. Nothing has saddened us at Limman House more than Percy's ultimate death, may, uh, sorry, my ult untimely death. May his memory and that of his courage and integrity uh, in, hopefully inspire us all. He will be missed but never forgotten. Cry the beloved man. When the, 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 we pursue activism of the media, it's never about the accolades, but the accolades that Percy uh, Kowosa received was in recognition uh, the world over, internationally, uh, about the work that he had done and the fact that he stood tall amongst his peers. He was and he remains peerless. Today, while there are many journalists uh, of courage the kind of persistent activism is generally muted, right, and increasingly suffering a disappearing fate. All sorts of offensives are launched against the media from all fronts. The question is, is, is the media able to take it and be able to be as activist as Pesit Koboza was? And this is why there is a poor solidarity in the media fraternity. Globally, uh, the premier was referring earlier about the spread between media. This is nothing. There is no solidarity. You know, as a media practitioner, you could be under fire. Don't expect the media to come supporting you. Uh, it, 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 it becomes uh, very rare. For example, when last was there a campaign to free jailed journalists around the world? Or even just across our border here in Zimbabwe? When journalists are jailed and tortured, I mean, we hear these stories, it's just like a footnote and we pass. Uh, unless I'm not aware, there isn't a massive campaign saying free journalists and so on. And I'll be sharing with you some of the statistics that are frightening around the world about how many journalists are languishing in prison as we speak. Today on Black Wednesday, it's only fit and proper, purposefully befitting that we remember Koboza's giant contribution to the media and its landscape, while doing deep introspection about how we are picking up his spear. I, I didn't caucus with the premier, but they, he, he already made a challenge to say, I better talk about introspection of how the media itself is conducting. So I'll come to that a little uh, later after I lambast how government is treating the media. <laughs> so don't worry, don't be impatient. <laughs> Today on Black Wednesday, it's only fit that we do so, we, we do that introspection. I dedicate this lecture to my sister-in-law, Pindile Kaba, who passed away early this year, and an accomplished uh, editor and journalist herself in, his, in this generation of courageous journalists who left a, a, a foundation of continued commitment to the quest for the freedom of the media. I also pay special tribute to the Koboza family who must be proud to have a Koboza who left a trailing blaze uh, for all of us uh, to emulate. Now, let's get into it now. We should all be, be, believe that despite our constitution specifically and potentially guaranteeing the freedom of expression, and, and this is quite important, that the, 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 there are many freedoms that are mentioned uh, you know, specifically in the Constitution. The freedom of press is mentioned very specifically in section 16 of the Constitution. And I, and I quote, that section says, everyone has the right to freedom of expression, which includes freedom of the press and other media, close quote. It's, it's very specific, it's not dilly darling about it. However, that mustn't fool you into believing that in fact that freedom is uncontested. Right? The Human Rights Commission has said many times it recognizes this is an important freedom, uh, you know, constitutional you know, protection and all of that, but it is not obvious. Right? It means that its 
existence in the constitution should not fool you into uh, uh, you know, relaxing and thinking, oh no, we've got now a democratic government, it's all going to be fine. And this is, doesn't just apply here. I'm going to give South Africa as an example, but it applies almost across uh, the globe. Such a freedom is unfortunately a constant target of the machinations of the politics of the day. Right? There is no gain saying that in the South African context, the post-94 era is 100 times better for journalists and for protecting their rights to do their way to ply their trade and all of that. However, we need not be naive about the fact that this fight for, them, for freedom it still has to be fought for every single day. In other words, this freedom is not free. As the popular Catholic song says, for those of you who are Catholic, freedom is not free. You have to sacrifice. You have to pay a price for your liberty. In a recent article in the Daily Maverick, Professor Glenda Daniels, she happened to have been my PhD supervisor, but I've already passed, so it's not like I'm buying face. <laughs> of, of, from the Vets Media Schools, you know, writes a very illustrative article that talks about vigilance that we must continue to exercise, that must still be exercised by all of us, despite what the Constitution says about this freedom. German philosopher Jürgen Habermas crafted the theoretical framework. This is what there was a bane of my life for a whole year, and uh, it was force fed to me for a whole year by, by my supervisor. So go and read this book, the whole year. Well, I'll see you next year. So I took four things from what Habermas said. The whole issue of media freedom and so on is about citizens. It's not about the media and so on. The media is just instruments. It's about how, how do citizens participate in a democracy? And how does the media then make sure that that's possible? So he, he identified four pillars. Firstly, is general access or accessibility of information. You may take it for granted because you're at university and you've got access to research. But think of somebody at Maduba Duba who, has, who wants to understand the ministerial handbook. I mean, that's impossible. I don't even know how you translate it into Kosa to the ministerial handbook. I'm sure they'll understand that the ministers don't pay for electricity. You, you could translate that. But that's only a section of the ministerial handbook, you know. Eradication of privilege. Again, you can take it for granted, but actually you are very privileged just to be here because you could pick up a phone, you know, go into the internet, find, find, find stuff out. Even go to court and insist that the government tell you, you know, what is the next draft of the ministerial handbook. I mean, it's being withdrawn somewhere or something. But even that is privileged information. Quest for the truth. Some people take it for granted and say, oh, you know, if you say these things, you're going to hurt people. And please, don't be too uncomfortable if I start lambasting a few people, you know, who may be your friends, their premier or whatever, you know. But the quest for the truth is key. If the journalism doesn't, doesn't pursue the truth, it must just go home, you know. Then the quality of public participation. Uh, you know, if you look at how Parliament passes law, so the government, uh, the government, or governing party comes up from Polokwane and he says we're going to dissolve the Scorpions, and then they they hold parliamentary hearings. I mean, it's crazy. They, 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 then people come to their parliamentary hearings, and uh, it's a tick box exercise. So it's not a, it's not qualitative participation. It's just that I will call the meeting, or we call them in biz, or it's just a big jamboree. People are waiting for the lunch. But before the lunch, they, are, they, they ask some questions, and the politicians walk away and come back the following year, and nothing has happened, or very little has happened. So those four things are key. Now, just think about those things in the absence of a media. Will there be quality of participation if the media doesn't provoke and, and, and question? Would there be a quest for the truth uh, if that truth is suppressed? Right? Is there classing to say that if you are in this LSM, you don't have to know too many things. We just, we just summarize for you in general terms. As long as you get your social grant, please keep quiet type of thing. So, so the media would make these things possible. All of these elements of what you call the, 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 the ideal public sphere right, mean little if there is no media to facilitate that connection between the governed 
and the governors. Right? So democratic participation becomes a pipe dream if there's no facilitation of that connection. Uh, the days of one-way communication are over. It, it's got to be two-way. We communicate to the public, the public is able to communicate back to you. It becomes a source of power and privilege to know certain information instead of a source of empowerment. Right? So do you need to understand the freedom of the press around those issues. It's not just for the sake of it, or that media can just say what they like. No, no, no. It's a, we're busy building a country here. And the big question should be, what is the role uh, of the media in that regard? There is no second guessing that where uh, we would be if, you know, where, where would we if the media did not expose some of the, the things that were happening in the dark? You know, how would we know of monies in the matras? <laughs> how would we know of a big wall that is bigger than a bond, just to put the wall? Well, to put the wall is very expensive. But that one will cost 260 million. It's just, just, just the wall, not the whole house. But the media had to question because that, that wall was, at some point was 50 million. And then it was times four before we knew it. Right? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, a lot of you here look old enough to remember the info scandal of the citizen. Right? Uh, you may have read it somewhere, isn't it? You, because you didn't just know it by osmosis. So somebody had to report it. Right? So you can see the critical nature of a media in a democracy. Um, uh, th there is no doubt that this pillar of our democracy is key. No one is called the fourth estate because it complements the other three estates that run the country. The World Index speaks of a critical decline in media freedom and points out that this is due to a democracy itself being threatened. Right? So it's, the media freedom is not threatened in a vacuum. In a country where there's a despot for a head of state or where there people either run away and the media is part of that. Um, I'm not sure how many Zimbabwean journalists are here, but they, they, so at some point they said, oh, this is too terrible. I can't queue for a steak or petrol. Let me just go somewhere else. In that process, the media is also a part of a society that's under oppression. So it's not the oppression in a vacuum, uh, but the oppression in a context of what's happening. So the index paints a very grim picture of arrests and torture of journalists, even in so-called mature democracies like the United States. You know, you can't believe how much interrogation uh, of journalists happen at borders of the United States. It, it's actually horrendous, as, as I will tell you later about the numbers, right? Uh, you would think, for example, that the seizure of equipment of journalists, I mean, there are so many cameras here. Imagine that those being seized to say, bring here, and they delete it and whatever. You know, uh, in, the, in the old days, they used to take out the tape, because now there's no longer tape, it's digital. But they used to take out the tape and give you the, the camera back if, if you are lucky. You know, you would think that this is a thing of the past, but not according to this index. Journalists still have their equipment seized and so on. You know, that's why with television, sometimes we just, you know, interview a very controversial person in a different country. We, 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 we immediately send it to the studio as we talk to you. So when you take the equipment, we just say, oh, just take it. But we know it's already back at the office. We have to do those kind of tactics, uh, not because it's fun, but because there is still a sense of people wanting to control uh, what the media re re report. So this index is a very, very worrying sign, and I'll share some of the statistics with you later. Let's use South Africa now. I want to come to the meat of this thing. Let's meet South Africa about the link between the politics of the day and how the media is treated. That is very important. So it's not a vacuum. The freedom of the press is not a vacuum. For it established in South Africa, it's in the Constitution. But now, uh, as it happens with many things, where there are good policies, the implementation becomes poor for some reason. And this is part of the big problem we have. We don't have problems with policies and a nice constitution. We have problems with how we implement it. Now let's, let's come to South Africa and, and look at, um, and this is just not something that I'm just saying from my head. This was four years of research through my PhD, which was called uh, um, uh, uh, Bridging the Gap, the analysis of the, the complicated relationship between the media and the government. So if you look at the, the relationship between the media and the Mandela administration, it was, it was what we could call a, a honeymoon period. You know, we're all euphoric, even the media were euphoric. Mandela is a saint and all of that. Mandela was very, very uh, accessible to the press. I know you, know, you may think it's obvious, but it, 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 it showed very uh, late, uh, later in our democracy, it was not so obvious. 
Mandela was accessible, you could meet him informally, formally as journalists and so on. But even at that stage, there were worrying signs. M Mandela met with journalists and it's recorded in something called the Rose Journal. And as he was talking to them, he said, you know, black journalists are lackeys of white editors. I'm, I'm loosely paraphrasing him, but you know, you know how he's, he, can, he can go. So the journalists were saying, no, but this is, this is not on. And, you know, I mean, imagine saying somebody like Matata said is a lackey of a white editor. I mean, that's, that's preposterous. <coughs> you understand? Uh, but, but even then, there wasn't outrage in the media. I mean, if somebody said that now, there would be outrage. There would be, you know, reams of things written ab about that. So we ignored that a bit because of the euphoria, and that came to bite later because it was a sign that says, New government will do them in the trenches, so they expect a bit of favors. But actually, the black journalists were, were very mild in their criticism of the government. By the way, with government, even if no uh, matter how mild the criticism, they will still, you know, look or, 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 or be uncomfortable with what you are saying. There are a number of government people who just don't like criticism, uh, which may mean that they're in the wrong profession. Because if you are a politician, you will be criticized um, most of the time. So, the, the, this mild criticism, therefore, was not taken kindly, even in the context of Mandela, but because it was a Mandela, we deferred a little bit to him. This meant that the media would, what, had to be vigilant from day one, after 1994, and not relax and say, oh, these are our comrades, we're with them in the struggle and in the, in the trenches. Right? The contestation did not end there. There was a continued debate about what the role of the media is expected to be in a democracy. That started right there uh, within the Mandela administration. In other words, media freedom for what purpose? Don't just say media freedom for the sake of it. No, for what purpose? In a, in a paper delivered by ANC policy czar, Joel Nechitenze, the big question of national interest versus public interest was used to answer the question, media freedom for what? For what purpose? The debate mutated into a discussion about what German philosopher uh, Habermas framed as the ideal public sphere. Is the role of the media today merely as a watchdog or a nation builder? Or is that a false dichotomy? For, uh, uh, usually, you know, sort of propagated by people who are proponents of what is called sunshine journalism. So please don't, you know, we're building a nation here, don't be too critical, that kind of thing. That was a, a real debate, uh, especially within the first administration uh, of Mandela. In other words, the watchdog role should very much be considered to be an act of nation building because it becomes the, the, a voice of the voiceless, right? Uh, so that the governed are able to talk back to those who, uh, who are governing them, right? So if you are a watchdog, it doesn't mean you are necessarily negative because when you point out that corruption, at inefficiency at poor service delivery and so you are building a nation because you are saying premier we expect better you understand we, ex we expect better of you we don't expect you to sit and relax and enjoy the packs which you must reduce you know uh, but we expect you to actually work for the people right um, and media is very resistant when you say nation building they say no, no, no don't don't tell us what to do and so we'll come to that a little later because Two, both of those things can live side by side. You can be a watchdog, but you can also be a nation builder. A newspaper can expose corruption, but also educate its readers about what government is doing well, what government is, is, is doing, you know, to, 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 in a sense, to implement its, its manifesto. Anyway, going now to the second era, I'm not combine Mandela, sorry, Mbeki era and the Zuma era. The, the honeymoon soon became over under Mbeki. The relationship became very frosty, and in most cases, they were f fueled by the media's unflinching coverage of the HIV-AIDS denialism led by President Beck. 
as well as the so-called quiet diplomacy over the crisis in Zimbabwe. Those two things became a source of pain, right, both for the Mbeki administration and it really irritated uh, the president then. These two subjects, uh, of course, were, and, and were, were the constant refrain about emerging, uh, and also the constant refrain about the emerging corruption, taste of the so-called gravy train. I don't know if you remember, that, 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 that word has disappeared a bit, but in the first you know, two terms, there was an issue about the gravy train. And when you, when you listen to Mandela talk about the gravy train, you, you just laugh, because he says, we're going to stop the gravy train. And of course, you know, he, he didn't know that they were, they were going to make it even a how train. It's going to be faster. <laughs> you know, uh, so, so, so those are the things that froze relations between the media and the Mbeki administration. The administration felt that the freedom of the media was overboard, it was too much now. And they still feel so, some of them. And in fact, that, you know, the, the wings of the media must be clipped. They were very clear. Now, all of these things uh, are, are signs that says, yes, the Constitution says freedom of the press and what they even mentioned specifically. But in practice, you meet that freedom is, can be under attack subtly and, and sometimes even directly. So a few things happened during the, particularly those two administrations. Firstly, the GCIS replaced what was called the South African Communication Service, which was a propaganda riddled body. It was there to just say, uh, you know, these black people are, are mad, what part of it is fine. That's really what they are mandate. So GCIS came to, to operate something that was linked to what was called the, the Communication 2000 Report, or, or otherwise uh, in short called Comtask. Right, which was a joint effort by government and some big media personalities to try and create a communication system in government that would, in a sense, germinate or support or protect the freedom of the media. But of course, that was not to be perfect. It was not perfect at all. In fact, in other instances, it was not to be. President Mbeki took a stance that the media was biased and failed to tell the story of the ANC administration and ANC government. And accordingly, this gave birth to letters from the president. I don't know whether some of you remember them. They're in a thick book now, so many letters written every week by the president in what was called, was still called ANC today. Mbeki sustained what one can call tirades uh, against all and sundry. If you are mentioned there, you know you are in big trouble. Uh, you know, through these letters, he was able to direct at his political enemies, directed to the media, directed everywhere. Uh, and the media lapped it up. And he, he managed in that way for that short time that he did those to set the agenda of what the public was discussing. This was a great idea, but it was not a sustainable idea. as a counterforce of what the media is. The media is massive and so on. As government, you can't try to compete in that space in that way. You've got to be able to have a communication strategy that can be able to turn some of those platforms to your advantage. But that, you know, so the idea that you just create letters to the president and that will replace the media that's biased was a little bit misplaced. But it was unsustainable because he could only do it un until he left office. And then came President Zuma. President Zuma, remember Mbeki wrote these letters every week, right? President Zuma, when he arrived, he wrote exactly one letter. <laughs> in which he said, I'm not going to write too often. I'm going to give other comrades to write. <laughs> you know, so I'm not sure whether other comrades wrote them. So, but it showed you the thing was, was unsustainable. Zuma preferred to go and start his own newspaper. It's called The New Age and his television station called ANN7. Now, please understand me, a lot of heads of state try to influence the media in one way or another. But not directly walk into the newspaper offices and say, please, you must write this, please, the TV, what is going to be the, the, the logo, what's going to be the thing, I mean, honestly, you know? That, that's the brazen part of what President Zuma, you know, he, he's, he's, he's a bit of an activist, but on this one, he's a bit overboard. You know, we all know what happened to the ANN7 of my friend Mzwanele there. Uh, but of course, this thing about I'm going to write, uh, uh, comrades must write, was a proper cop out, right? And it, it showed you that there, there must be a different strategy by government to be able to influence uh, the press. We, now, in, in terms of the established you know, media diversity now, 
government established something called the Media Diversity Agency. It was supposed to be a, like a, 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 a what do you call it, a, 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 a partnership, right, between government and the private sector. But it was totally underfunded. A media is, is, industry is, is a multi-billion industry. You can't give some, you know, body 30, 30 million and say they must change a multi-billion industry. You, they, 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 that multi-billion industry will just laugh at you, which is what has happened because the MDD has fallen into dysfunction um, and, and has not really created any media diversity. In fact, any success story of the MDDA, the private sector soon slaps it up or takes it, incorporates it or into the private sector, and then you are left with the community sector that is beholden to, to private interest. And that brings another issue about the threat of media freedom coming from a private sector. Right? Comes from government, yes, but it also comes uh, you know, from, from the private sector. So, so the, the community media sector uh, is not even an answer to our media diversity. Uh, in terms of the law, community media has, has to be owned by the community. So people sit on the board, the community has to have a say, what has happened is that those people have turned those community radio stations into a piggy bank, and half of them are dysfunctional. They, don't, they owe you cash some money. It's just a mess, a terrible mess uh, there of, uh, in terms of instead of media diversity. The ANC NEC led by Mbeki at the top, at the back of the negative coverage of his administration, concocted something called the Media Appeals Tribunal. This atrocious proposition was meant to be an ominous sword hanging over the media's head. You know, actually, we went to a conference and said there must be a media tribunal, you know, because this media is, 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 is bothering comrades, man. It's taking away the dignity of comrades. They must go to jail if they release that information, that info. It was just a terrible proposition. But the media was vigilant, hopefully. Um, and while the ANC comrades were fighting over power after the palace coup of Pologuan, uh, we must be thankful for small, mess, small messes because that idea, f you know, in a sense, died a natural death and never, uh, uh, you know, saw the light of day. But the media was busy uh, preparing to take that silly idea all the way to the Constitutional Court. But imagine that if you said something wrong and, you know, as media practitioners, it's something you get some things wrong. You go to prison for it to 20 years. I mean, just, just, just quite bizarre. But I'm glad that it died. And then, Finally, Zuma waged a cold warfare. Remember, we were analyzing the link between the politics and the media freedom, right? It got worse now. With Zuma, he waged a full-on warfare with the media. And this included, you know, suing cartoonists. I mean, it was bizarre. You know, the, the poor, poor Zapiro would be in court because he put a shower on Zuma's head after he said he showered after whatever, you know and talked about onions and all that. Then they put a shower on his head for, for many months. And, and then he, he, was, he was not pleased about that. Now, media freedom was threatened on numerous counts. The, 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 the piloting of a so-called secrecy bill through parliament was another painful blow and a direct threat to media freedom. To say that if you dare talk about something that's unclassified and once, People insist on classification, you must know there's something to find out, and journalists naturally will go and try and find it out, but you go to prison for it, according to a secrecy bill. Uh, it, it, it had some 800 amendments from the public. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what happened, what finally happened to it, but it was, it was a terrible, terrible idea. And opposite of what legislation was passed under the Mandela administration, which give unfettered access, actually, uh, because I'm sure at that time there was little to hide, um, or, or it was hidden well, I'm not sure, but you know, uh, the, the, the media had more access information at that time. Now, the, the use of, of, of government resources to punish unfriendly press, can you believe that? I mean, it, it was, was, you know, it, it was not a, a too well hidden a secret, you know? So government in somewhere in between the Mandela administration and the, sorry, the Mbeki administration and the Zuma administration would punish a, a, a newspapers for, 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 for being too hard on them. Um, the culprits here were the likes of Dr. Blaine Zimande, who targeted the city press for their robust coverage of the, the, the Zuma presidents and commentary. Zimande, a minister of 
higher education, who should know better than to suppress free thought, called for an insult law. Can you believe it? <laughs> to say that, please, this media is insulting the president too much, man. We must have an insult law to protect Jacob Zuma from being attacked by the media and lampooned. In other words, cartooned. You know, there can be a law that stops you from cartooning the president. You know, something that even le every leader uh, must be able to stomach. If you're a leader, you must be able to stomach criticism, stomach cartoons. You know, uh, you know when I, you know, I, I, I published my book, I had a cartoon of, of, of President Zuma outside as a cover. Uh, along with other leaders like Bumalema and others, but it was, a, it was a nice cover with a cartoon, a cartoon cover. And then his spokesperson, or ex-spokesperson, Zalema, he said, how can you, you, how can you, you, you project the president like this? He not even read the book, he just saw the cover and said, no, 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 this is bad. You know, and, the, and, 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 and then the, this is serious stuff. You know, and then the, 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 the late Deputy Secretary General, may his may soul rest in peace, summoned me to her office to say, eh, we want to understand where you stand with us. How can you say, how can you insult the head of state day in and day out like this? You know, where, where do you stand with us? Karno, I'm not sure where I should stand with you <laughs> when I've been in the NC since I was 14 years old. So I'm not sure if I'm almost 50 now where I should stand. You know, but I was a mom to the house, it's not a joke, you know, and to, to answer why I wrote such a terrible book. And in that book, there was a 5,000 word letter to President Zuma, you know, asking her to greet some of the wives. And then I got into big trouble by that. <laughs> anyway, Warren Becky was paranoid over the, the, the media. Zuma had the, the likes of Blaine Zimande doing the bidding to suppress media freedom, right? But this was not unique to his administration. In the Mbeki administration, Esop Pahad, Esop, I don't know where he is now, but Esop Pahad wrote a memo to the government communication to say he must stop advertising in the Mail and Guardian. You know, Mail and Guardian was vicious. And their scene was to run a headline that says, is Mbeki fit to rule? They wrote the day they printed that headline ahead of Mbeki ascending to 1999. And then in 2006, they had to change the edit. It was bad. They were going down the tubes now because you know, half of the, the thing was government advertising. They had to change their editor, and the owner had to go with a begging bowl to government departments, agencies, and say, so, sorry, we have turned a new leaf. Please forgive us. You think your constitution says freedom of the press? There is threats to it under your very noses. This conduct, and I've just given two examples of the city press, Muslim, and the mail and guide, but there, there, there are numerous others. But this was a direct assault on the freedom of the press. The Ramaphosa administration, now let's come to that in, in, in the end. We could call it, and the psychologists here will understand it, they, 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 they was what you can call passive aggressive to the media. So we like you one day, we don't like you, we like that one, you know, we, we pick and choose. And they, they, they started off on a wrong foot uh, by trying to gag the media. That was one of the first actions I had of being president by uh, President Ramaphosa. He, he took the Sunday Independent to court to stop a Sunday story. And of course he failed. But what was interesting was that the Sunday Times, oh, by the way, uh, that, that story is it's where the, the nickname Cupcake come from. They, they're trying to write about his cupcake things. And then he tried to stop them by court. The Sunday Times had an opposite headline on the same Sunday. These ones were talking about cupcakes and what? These ones were saying, Ramaphosa Viva, you know, to 2017. And that told you right there that something was fishy in terms of the media capture. Because you cannot have just such diverse, and this is the same story now that you are seeing with Media 24. And so the other ones are on the other side uh, making, doing the bidding for one candidate. The other ones are in this faction. It's a bad thing. Uh, uh, and we'll talk about that just now. So the, the, the capture is another threat, right? It now takes me to the media themselves being a threat to their own freedom. Because when the integrity has a question mark on it, you must worry. You must worry, worry very much. So th there must never be an assumption that the, in, the, in, the, in the political uh, uh, sphere, right, 
that the media is an innocent bystander. It's not. It's not because they then have to live in an island. Because if, they, if the society is having that debate about whether to trust the media or not, the media themselves have to answer the question, how are they fueling that uh, particular situation? It is a capture that is a danger to media freedom, over and above the state and business where we have deliberated. Right. By the way, the state is, uh, I, I just gave those examples, but it doesn't mean the others were innocent. I mean, the DA uh, in, in Cape Town under Helen Zille did not flinch to cut off the, 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 the Cape Times and said, hey, what? We are spending money on the Cape Town, what? Especially after uh, if Iqbal Seve took it over. They said, no, no, it's an ANC thing now. Let's, let's cut. And they cut it. So it's not a, an ANC thing. It's a government thing. The government has a tendency to feel uncomfortable if they have a media that they cannot trust to do their bidding. Right? But the media in itself, by being factional, gives credence and it, it, it helps a, who, those who want to suppress freedom of expression right, to weaponize that situation. And that is a matter that we must uh, be able to, uh, uh, you know, to accept as a media. The media has its favorites. And Mal Malema likes to say this a lot. But let me give you an example, my favorite one. Uh, just last week, or let me, let me put it this way, only last week, after four years of atrocious failures to manage failing SOEs, Pravin Godan received a headline from the Daily Maverick that simply said, failed. And I had a big picture of him there. Jesus said, failed. But yeah, these things are changing. <laughs> Pravin Godan gets a headline saying, failed. But this is after four years of incompetence at Dinel, at SAA, at Transnet, at Mangu, at SA Express. I mean, it's a litany, man. And none of them have called for his firing. None of the media has called for Pravin Godan. Okay, by the way, I may have missed it because it maybe it's on page 43 at the bottom column where nobody can find it. Where they say, I think Pravin must go. <laughs> but, but at least last week, had a big headline. But they have their favorite. That's a problem with, with the media. Right? In other words, another threat to media freedom is some rogue and captured media practitioners. The so-called brown envelope journalism amongst other things and amongst other omissions. You would remember yeah, the former ambassador of, the South, of South Africa in the US, Ibrahim Rasul, must name these things because if it's general, people will not get the, the picture. This guy gave money to a journalist at the Agas to write good you know, stories about him. I mean, I don't understand because he's such a nice guy. You could write stories about him without him paying anything. But he felt the need to give a brown envelope underneath. So that he can, I don't know what for, he could be premier of the West Indies. I'm not sure what it was, that was about. Right? Now, uh, uh, but it's only because he's that uh, was the one who got caught. He's not, he's not he's the only one. Right? I mean, you remember Gwede Mantashe, you know, a uh, very nice uncle, another uncle in the media, another media's favorite uncle, who, by the way, I understand he has some shares in some media organizations which he's never admitted, but that's a different matter. Okay, he can go to court if he likes. I'm used to that. Right? Uh, he tried to bribe a Sunday well journalist not to write his shenanigans. You know? And then dismissed it to say there's nothing like that and what, and they, they recorded him saying it. You know, and, and when I'm faced with a decision to, to trust Makuru Sefara, who was editor then, and Gwede, I would trust Makuru any day. You know? so, so, so this uh, impression right, that you can actually get a good story by giving money a brand envelope it m must, must stop if the media is serious itself about uh, you know, uh, keeping that integrity. Ramaphosa carried on uh, for the last four years refusing to tell us who funded his campaign. And you would have thought there would be a big outrage, media would be up in arms. No, only one media organization went to court, the Amabungani, to say, no, 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 please or unseal, unseal the things. There's no class action by the media and so on, because maybe he's, he's uh, indeed the, the, the favorite. And for an administration that ascended as a media darling on the back of a ticket of transparency, it's ironical that there, there indeed hasn't been an outcry, but you know, Besides Amabungani, as I said, nobody else, other media has gone on with their 
media freedom lives, you know, without a bother. I, mean, I suppose the media has also has a freedom to pursue certain stories and not others. Pesiko Boza was fiercely independent. Some of his peers tell me that they were very frustrated with him because he was impossible to influence when it came to what he was going to editorialize. Right. Uh, so a couple of uh, the, the peers that I spoke to just said, hey, this guy was too, too difficult. We, we, we knew he was a comrade, but hey, just ask him to write even a sentence. Said, no, 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 no. You know? So he, he was, he, this is what we need to infuse in our media even more today. And I'm not saying that they aren't journalists of integrity. I'm just saying you've you got to be vigilant even in that regard to make sure that journalists don't get tempted to become a commodity where you can buy them to, to, to say certain things. A spirit of incorruptibility and leading by example is what we need in our media. Sadly, and in many ways uh, imaginable, the media has uh, become its worst enemy uh, in terms of the freedom of the press. Our media environment, we need to now come to, come to this introspection. Our media environment is ailing and it's not conducive to defending that freedom of choice, sorry, of uh, that freedom of the press. Just consider the following. Toxic work environments across media houses, almost without exception, very toxic. The people that are stressed, they, they, you know, they, their contracts are bad, you could be fired tomorrow uh, with, with no consequences for the, for the employer and so on. And what's worse is that some of the people who are now in charge of these rooms are journalists themselves. They were journalists and they used to complain about their bosses when they were junior. But now they're treating the staff the same way. It's bad, bad, bad. And it's across. Even the new ones who are coming up now who you thought, oh, this is going to be different. It's worse. Toxic. You need to accept that. Interference by by politicians and business people and owners in the newsroom. Very bad. They, they, and they can't help themselves, man. You understand? They will come from the top floor and say, why are we covering this story? Or, you know, it, 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 it's bad. It's just that I can't give two examples because people will, 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 will sort of know what I'm talking about. So I can't give too many examples. Although I've worked with all the newsrooms, so you can just guess, you know, how terrible some of the interference can, can be. Sexual harassment in media houses, gender-based violence in the newsroom. I mean, it's bad. Okay, generalization of the newsroom. Now this one is worse. So they, they now say, hey, the the, the 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 salary bill is too much. Let's just get intense, man. Just just go and cover Panyaza there in in uh, El Dorado. You understand? <laughs> I mean, this is a senior person who's been in, in the media forever. You send a junior journalist, he's going to intimidate the, them most. You know, and, and feed them whatever propaganda. And, it's, you're, and in this case, you're talking about the big propagandist. You know, <laughs> and if you send a junior journalist there, you are in big trouble. So I told that our newsrooms have become too junior. You know, when I was a government communicator some 25 years ago, each bead or, or, or subject matter had a specialist journalist. You know, when I worked for South African Airways, so the, the journalist who was writing there had 20 years experience of aviation. I mean, I couldn't tell him anything. In fact, he laughed at me. It's one of the worst moments of my career was when a journalist said to me, after I fed them a line, let me tell you what you should be saying. <laughs> Why? Because they had a friend in Exco where I didn't see it. And that friend told them the truth. And then I came with a line to say, yeah, this, is no, this is why we're no longer flying to India. They say, no, let me tell you what you should be saying. Because they were a big journalist, right, with experience in health, in transport, in, in this case, in aviation. That has disappeared from our newsrooms. A journalist has to cover five different subject matters or ten. By the time they get to your story, they, you can even write it for them because they're too lazy to go and read about it. It's bad. Brown envelope journalism, as I said, the syndrome there that has become perennial. So if you look at those things, it creates a very toxic environment in the media. And we can't then expect that with that environment, you can defend freedom of the press. All these incidents give journalism a bad name and discredits its stature and then it's weaponized by those who want to uh, silence us. 
Now, these linkages between politics and media freedom permeate the entire continent. When last did you hear any commotion by South Africa or SADC or even the AU about the harassment of journalists in countries like Zimbabwe, Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda? This silence is loud because of the lip service that these bodies pay to media freedom. The statistics of media freedom around the world are frightening. Let me take you around the world in five minutes. According to the Voice of America's article written by Bob Grover on December of 2021, the number of jail journalists worldwide has hit an all-time high. The Committee of, Pro of Protection of Journalists found that as of 1 December 2021, 293 journalists were imprisoned in 37 different countries. Up from 280 journalists in 2020. China was the worst offender. West, in, with 50 journalists imprisoned. Other countries with large numbers of journalists in prison include Myanmar, Egypt, Vietnam, and Belarus. No, no surprises there. Brazil, the Democratic Republic of, of Congo, India, Israel, Nigeria, and Philippines at least had, were holding at least one journalist each in prison at any one time. Chinese journalists currently imprisoned by Beijing, 127. Right? Meima went from one imprisoned journalist in 2020 to 26 in 2021. The civil war in Ethiopia overlapped with a large spike in the number of reporters jailed in that country, making it the second largest jailer of reporters in Africa. If I got the number wrong, the, the, the ambassador can correct me. But the reality is they've jailed journalists, you know. 57 journalists were arrested, you know, and, and detained in the United States in 2021 alone. China remains the worst jailer, right, as I said, with over 50 behind bars. 2020 also marked the sixth consecutive year where over 250 journalists were behind bars. At least 24 journalists were killed because of their, their coverage so far this year alone. 18 others died in circumstances too murky to, to determine whether they were specific targets or not. According to an article by, uh, by the Katharina Berchwood uh, on November 15, Turkey comes second after China with 37 uh, 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 you know, arrests or, or detention of journalists. As you can see from the list, our BRICS friends feature very prominent right, uh, in the blacklist. With the, these gruesome statistics, it begs the question, why is there no serious global campaign by all Democrats right, uh, you know, to, to essentially breaking down the door of SADC, of AU, of the United Nations Security Council to demand justice for these journalists? If there's a campaign, I may, I may have missed it, but it doesn't look like it's, too, then it's not so prominent. What would possibly be the use of the next memorial lecture of this nature if we don't use today's lecture to launch a spirited campaign to get our colleagues freed from these well jails? I call on SANEF, the National Press Club, and the University of South Africa to create a new nucleus in the name of Persit Koboza to make it difficult for regimes around the world to take away the hard-won freedom of the media. For those who, of you who, who like to read and you, you can access the lecture, I have put in a full figure that shows every country possible uh, in the last year or two of, and how many journalists, and, and all of them are triple figures here. Only one is, says, you know, in 2081, all the years it was over 100 and 
150, 200, 170. Every year, journalists who are jailed are fresh. That should trigger us to do something. To come and just have a lecture and feel good about Black Wednesday, it's not going to cut it. In the name of media freedom, fighters like Pesci Koboza, the media today has to resort to be extra vigilant. Even in jurisdictions like South Africa, where there are constitutional protections for the freedom of the media. SANEF has to actively campaign to support journalists in countries like Zimbabwe, the DRC, and so on, where harassment of journalists is the order of the day. According to MISA, over 20 journalists were jailed and tortured in Zimbabwe this year alone. Pressure has to be brought to bear through AU and all its organs to reign in countries that suppress freedom of the media. We can't pay proper tribute to Pesico Boza if we don't do these basics to keep his name alive. The fight for space for freedom of the media is not a bad thing and remains relevant and alive even today. Just last week, President Zuma resurrected to, to sue a journalist, Karen Moore, for talking about his media, or rather his medical records, which were already in the public domain. You understand? So I'm not sure who's advising him. But he's suing a journalist for saying something that was already mentioned anywhere else were in court. You don't need a long argument to know that if someone has a get out of jail free card, then the least we can do is we are entitled to know why. I've been at the BCCSA at least five times and received a dozen lawyers' letters from politicians such as Tulas Nwesi, Trevor Manuel, and Oscar Mabuyani for expressing my freedom of expression through the media. Here is an extract from a recent case from the BCCSA against Minister Nglesi. Quote, unquote, furthermore, since the complainant, Mr. Nglesi, is a public figure, his actions are open to scrutiny, close quote. This is a BCCA adjudication, it's not me, it's a BCCA. No, 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 sorry, sir, you are a public figure. The guy is just saying you are incompetent, it's his view. Let this serve as a warning to those politicians who have an appetite to suppress freedom. I've been there five times, I won all the cases. And I'm in court, I'm winning there as well, for all those who tried to take me there. In, <laughs> in the name of Nat Nakasa, Pindile Taba, and Pesi Tloboza, I will use my every breath to fight media freedom oppressors to the death because this freedom was not free. Pesico Boza and many others had to pay a price. They had to sacrifice for this liberty. Long live the spirit of Pesico Boza. Long live. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Tabani. Um, I, I even ran out of space to take notes because you've said quite a mouthful. Um, but thank you so much. And uh, to members of the media who are interested in uh, receiving a copy, of Prof. Tabani's uh, speech. It will be made available after the lecture. At this point in time, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to uh, invite our panelists. Thank you, Premier. I would like to invite our panelists to join us. Uh, Crystal, if you can come to the front and while she's making her way to the front, 
Let me just remind you that we are joined by three other panelists uh, virtually. Firstly, as I've mentioned earlier, Hopewell Chinono, Mulime uh, Tweu, as well as Buinelo Hadi. So I'm going to invite all three first um, to respond to the lecture, uh, starting with Hopewell. I think a lot of points that uh, Prof. Tabani touched on um, Hopewell, you can definitely relate to issues of solidarity, uh, the different bodies that are supposed to protect uh, the freedom of uh, media freedom, rather, in, in countries such as Zimbabwe, where you are based. I'm going to hand over to you to respond to the lecture. And then after you are done, I will invite Mole um, Metsuehu as well to weigh in. Um, just to quote on uh, the State of Newsroom's report that uh, has been made public by the Vets Journalism, especially pertaining to uh, the digitization of, of, of uh, uh, media space. It says that this, uh, due to digital economy, a drop in advertising and circulation for mainstream media, social media era and readers, as well as consumers of news, find a finding community on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, among other platforms. And uh, as Prof. Daban has, uh, has mentioned, the community media space, unfortunately, is uh, decimating. Um, but also, the emergence of these other alternative media platforms is raising questions around the regulation and uh, the information disorder, fake news, misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, and a whole lot more. But without taking any more of your time, hope well. Uh, welcome. Thank you for being patient. I know we started a bit late, and you joined quite early on the line, so I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I feel honored to have been asked to be part of such an uh, esteemed uh, panel. Um, and it's quite an onerous uh, act to speak after Professor JJ. I'm sure everyone would agree with me. Um, if he had made that lecture in Zimbabwe, he could be on his way to Chikurubi right now. So the issues that we touched on in terms of uh, how uh, we need solidarity. They, they, they are very important, um, especially to people like myself who have been to prison um, for simply doing our, our work. Um, I would like to acknowledge uh, the Koboza family, UNISA, and the National Press Club, and thank them for putting this together. It's very important, it's very rare that we get opportunities to engage as professionals on these issues. Um, and the public sometimes does not understand the battles that we have to fight uh, in order for them to get the news that they consume, whether be it on TV, radio, or uh, in newspapers. I come from a country which is the only country of substance uh, uh, in, in, in Africa with only one TV station. Um, Zimbabwe was the first country together with Nigeria in 1960 to have television. Today it is uh, the only country, as I said, of significance to have only one TV station, which is owned and run by the state. It is essentially a, a propaganda mouthpiece for the ruling ZANU-PF party. You do not get uh, to be talked about on that TV station unless you are being lampooned, unless you are being... Um, insulted unless you're part of group propaganda that is being used to criticize anyone, especially those that are fighting for democracy in, in, in Zimbabwe. Um, all radio stations in Zimbabwe are either owned by the state or surrogates of the state. One that is called uh, an independent radio station is actually owned by a ZANU-PF uh, member of parliament. And, and these are issues that have a huge impact on the way our people uh, interface with public affairs uh, in order for citizens to be able to make the right decisions um, in terms of how they relate with public affairs. They must have the correct information. Now, if they are being given propaganda every day, you will find that their thinking uh, also is tailor-made along those lines of lies and crude propaganda that are, are, are put to them. 
I've been a victim of, um, of, the, of, of the state in terms of uh, how I have done my work as an investigative journalist. A journalist. Um, I'm sure most of you are quite aware that I was arrested three times inside six months after I had exposed the looting uh, of that uh, the president's uh, niece had been, I was going to get bail and opposed. And the third time I was arrested for something I had not done using a law that does not even exist. So these issues are very important, uh, especially in terms of um, solidarity. It's important for South African journalists to understand that the same kind of solidarity that they got when they were uh, being um, persecuted by the apartheid regime is the same kind of solidarity that uh, we also expect from them, considering that South Africa is the, is the I, I think, the, the top country which runs the most sophisticated uh, economy on the continent. So what it says uh, matters. Silence sometimes uh, means a lot, and, and it's very difficult for us in Zimbabwe because the only country that we look up to <clears throat> in the region is South Africa in terms of defense, in order for us not to be persecuted, in order for us not to be thrown into prison. When I was thrown into prison in 2020, there was a hashtag called Zimbabwean Lives Matter. It started from South Africa and it had a huge impact on how the cases were handled and how the global community then got to engage with what was happening at that time. So what the prof said in terms of solidarity, uh, it's very important. I'm in France right now preparing to go back to Zimbabwe where again I'm being threatened uh, with another arrest. So I know that if that happens, I've got the prof on my side. He will be speaking loud as he said today that it's important to have that kind of solidarity. In Zimbabwe, journalists have been subjected to violence um, as recent as just last week. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, again, journalists were beaten up and some were, were, were in hospital. Um, journalists are routinely uh, arrested for doing their work. Even if they show the accreditation card, we live in a police state where you have to be accredited as a journalist. You can't practice without giving the, getting the nod from the government. So even if you show that accreditation card, sometimes you can be you can be beaten up. Uh, you can be thrown into a police van uh, for no apparent reason. You can be persecuted through the courts, which are captured, and uh, sometimes you are denied bail. I spent 85 days in prison for simply practicing uh, uh, journalism. Uh, we have captured by the, by the state something that the prof talked about. The capture in South Africa is subtle. Um, it's more like a willing seller, willing buyer kind of arrangement. But in Zimbabwe, it's not like that. As I said, there's only one TV station. Uh, all, all the radio stations are owned by the state or by surrogates of the states. And virtually all newspapers now have been captured either through being run by the state or, or members of the state or the ruling party buying shares into those uh, newspapers. So you, you, you should not be um, surprised to know that uh, the most popular television station in Zimbabwe right now is SABC News, because that's the only station that Zimbabweans now rely on in terms of news. And that's why you see that even the president's spokesperson goes after Sophie Mokena, who is the foreign affairs editor for SABC News because of the coverage, uh, the fair coverage that he and their team are giving uh, to, to, to Zimbabwean issues. Um, according to the state, according to ZANU-PF, according to the spokesperson of the president, George Charamba, she shouldn't have been doing that. And she gets insulted in the most uh, degrading way that one can ever uh, insult a woman. But those are the sort of things that we have to live with every day, that we've lived with every day. So if they can uh, insult Sophie Mokena, who is coming from a powerful country like South Africa, what could they do to local Sophie Mokenas who have no protection at all? Um, I'll leave that to your imagination. We have laws that have been put in place to muzzle the press, to make sure that 
you do not practice uh, journalism. They can just come and say that uh, you have reported a lie and you are thrown into prison. It happened to me. I did not actually say what, what I was being accused of having said. The law that was being used had been expunged from the uh, Constitution of Zimbabwe. But still, I spent about 23 days in prison for something I had not said or written and using a law that does not exist. So that's the lawfare aspect um, that we have to deal with uh, in, in, in Zimbabwe. Um, freedom of expression is now a luxury in, in Zimbabwe. Um, I remember my first encounter with uh, Pesi Koboza was the Pesi, Pesi speech. Uh, one of my classmates at journalism school uh, was a PAC uh, uh, cadre who is now a general in the South African army. They had these newspapers and they would share, and that was my first encounter uh, with Pesi Koboza, reading and saying, wow, these people are able to say these things that we are not even able to say in a supposedly independent country. Because during that time, uh, the routine abuse of uh, journalists in the media had already started somewhere already being threatened, somewhere picked up by the Secret Service and tortured like Mark Chavunduka. Uh, and, and those things continue up to this very day to a point where the, the arrest and incarceration and persecution of people like myself has made young journalists in Zimbabwe very terrified and scared of doing their work because the assumption is that if they can do it to a senior journalist like Hopewell, then what will happen to me? And that seems to be working in a sense because we see a lot of uh, self-censorship by journalists and they, they self-censor because they know that there's no international outrage when journalists are are, are, are arrested in Zimbabwe, as, as the prof has, has, has said. If there is international outrage or even regional outrage and uh, or South African outrage uh, in the way that the professor had said, the Zimbabwean government would think twice before it throws um, bogus charges at journalists for simply doing their work. I'm, I'm proud to, to be in the same boat with uh, uh, Percy Koboza and uh, uh, Nat Nakasa is a Neiman Fellow at uh, Harvard University, where I met a lot of uh, journalists from countries that the prof has spoken about who are being persecuted. And sometimes you find that you end up creating that sort of group of journalists from people that are being persecuted. And sometimes we say to ourselves, why is it that we have to to get that kind of solidarity from ourselves who are being persecuted. What about our brothers and sisters who are coming from countries that are not being persecuted? And I hope what the professor said will sink into the minds of the South African journalists. Uh, and, 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 you know, um, we used to laugh at Zambia. We used to laugh at the repression that was taking place in Zambia. We used to laugh at the economic collapse of Zambia. And we thought that uh, as Zimbabweans, we, we had this exceptionalism of thinking that it will never happen to us, it will never be like the rest of Africa. We are educated, we are Zimbabwean. That would never happen to us. But today, Zimbabwe um, does not have a single uh, working radiotherapy machine in any of its public hospitals. Uh, and when we report about these things, we are called uh, Western puppets. When we report that the biggest hospital in Zimbabwe has got only one single maternity theater that was built in 1977 by Ian Smith, when we report that 2,500 women are dying every year giving birth, when we report that all these things are caused by the looting of public funds, the plunder of the nation's natural resources, when we report that the government is able to buy land cruisers, which they uh, inflate the price to 400,000 US dollars, and that a, a land cruiser can build uh, uh, 11 maternity clinics. We are called uh, traitors. Um, when we report that it's not sanctions that are causing the demise of the Zimbabwean economy, um, and, and when the South African state and its president go around the world misrepresenting the reality of life in Zimbabwe, saying that the problem in Zimbabwe is sanctions and yet it is the looting of public funds, it leaves us powerless. 
and we we expect solidarity from South African journalists to uh, bring to order uh, their political elites who are doing things that inflict pain on our people. In 2008, it was painful. I was the first journalist to break the story of post-election violence in Zimbabwe. Hundreds of people were killed. Uh, people had their hands hacked uh, by, 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 by ZANU-PF and the state. And President Mbeki flew into Zimbabwe and said there's no crisis in Zimbabwe. And when South Africa says those sort of things, or when a South African president says those sort of things, the world listens because this South Africa is like the point person of issues in the region and at times in, 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 uh, in Africa. SADAC has totally collapsed. It does not exist. It does not represent the interests of of Zimbabweans or of citizens uh, within the region. Uh, the media uh, 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 elements in, in, in that are supposed to be supervised by the SADAC um, with protocols of how governments are supposed to behave, those protocols are not being uh, followed. And when South African media does not hold their government to account for its contribution to that abuse of the media in the region by uh, sister nations, it, it makes it very difficult uh, for us. That's why you find that uh, we have millions of our people running away, seeking um, uh, economic uh, refuge in South Africa. And all those things would not be happening if uh, the media in SADC was robust, if the media in SADC was able to ask the leaders uh, of those countries to account for their actions. Uh, just last year, I, I, I gave a speech, a keynote speech at the Nat Nakasa 23rd uh, Media Awards. The Zimbabwean government stopped me from flying out to South Africa. There was no outrage, not even in the South African media. They, the SABC and some parts of the media just covered that he was not allowed to come. But here I am a journalist, I'm not a criminal. I've been denied the right to fly out and address a media gathering. And yet there's no outrage within the region. There's no outrage even in South African media. So those, 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 those are some of the things that I will say for now. And, and uh, I, was, I felt very emotional when the prof spoke about solidarity because we need it a lot. Uh, sometimes it's very painful for people like myself, because you end up getting solidarity from countries away from Africa. And yet our African colleagues uh, fail to give this solidarity. We end up getting solidarity from as far as, uh, as uh, America, and as far as Britain, Europe, Australia. And yet solidarity coming from fellow Africans, not just the media, but African citizens would be more powerful and we'll be sending a more powerful message to regimes that behave in this way towards the media. I would end for now by saying that um, there's a journalist called Itai Zamara who was an activist. He was abducted and never to be seen. One of the demands uh, on the American sanctions list, which which I I don't I don't uh, support sanctions because they they don't work in the case of Zimbabwe, but one of the demands is to say the Zimbabwean government must investigate and put out a report what happened to this journalist. The Zimbabwean government has not done that; uh, it refuses to do that. One of the um, uh, requirements of the sanctions list is that the Zimbabwean government must follow the rule of law. All the demands that are being asked for by the international community for these sanctions to go are found within our constitution. The Zimbabwean government is not being asked to do something peculiar, something new. It's being asked to follow the constitution of Zimbabwe and these sanctions would go away. Yet we find President Ramaphosa and many other uh, SADA presidents going around the world demanding for sanctions to be removed, but not demanding for the Zimbabwean government to implement the constitution which uh, these problems have attracted these sanctions. 
So I, I, I'm, I'm very grateful uh, for being invited to be part of this esteemed panel. Um, and as I said, it's quite difficult speaking after Professor JJ, um, but, but this, these are my remarks for now. And uh, thank you very much. Tabani touched on sunshine journalism. Is it a thing in Botswana? Uh, what is the community media as well looking like? And what are the everyday challenges of being a journalist in Botswana? Over to you, Binelo. Um, thank you very much, Musidi. I hope I'm audible. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great. Um, thank you so much. I think first things um, for, you know, inviting me onto this um, a platform and forum. Um, it's, it's a great honor. And I would like to congratulate you, um, you know, for this in initiative, um, because I think it's such a great thing. And especially deciding to also now um, extend the invitation beyond the borders of South Africa. It's interesting because sitting here, uh, we have the same problems, maybe slightly in, in a slightly different way, but um, I think more forums like this can really uh, work well for us because it seems we do face um, similar problems and uh, so we are in similar situations as the media. Um, thank you very much uh, to Professor Tavani for that um, incredible uh, and, and insightful lecture. Really, really enjoyed that. Um, and picked up quite a few things which I thought were similar to what I had um, sort of put down as my points for the day. Um, I think you're painting a scenario of our situation here in Botswana. I will just uh, do it this way, just a brief history of where we've come from, from the last regime, uh, which was before 2019, the 10 years before that, and then in the current, uh, we're under the current regime. Um, before, uh, in the you know in the last regime, uh, there was a lot of brutality, extreme brutality that we had never witnessed in Botswana, for sure, where a good number of journalists were arrested, um, they were harassed, uh, phones were tapped. Um, we all knew, uh, you know, it was it was it wasn't even done in an apologetic or secretive manner that our phones were tapped um, and a lot of media houses lost their income because the biggest or maybe the strongest way for government to punish media houses was to cut um, or completely stop advertising or cut the budget um, for the media houses. So it was quite a difficult um, period for Botswana. It's interesting, I don't know if um, where you are, you, this is something that you knew about um, being in South Africa or Hopewell being in Zimbabwe, because um, some, you know there's this image that Botswana is this peaceful country beacon of Africa, but um, on the ground it's interesting to see that the situations that are faced in other countries we also do face here. Now when we move to the current situation, some would say um, it's slightly better. Conditions have eased, but not easy by any means. One, there's no freedom of information law in place, which means that it's very difficult. Uh, freedom, uh, freedom of information law, yeah, which means that it's very difficult to access information, especially from government institutions. And there's nothing you know you can do about it currently. If they don't want to give you the information, you won't get the information. And also. There is this Media Practitioners Association bill. I did see that a few um, media houses in South Africa wrote about it, 
which was passed recently in Parliament here. It is a very heavy, um, ambiguous, uh, you know, legislation that has got a lot of great areas that um, give room for government to be able to abuse the press. So, um, and it also reinforces some laws, you know, there are these defamation laws that expose journalists to a lot of litigation potentially for anything that they write. So um, this one, I think it will be, um, as Hopewell said, uh, I think it will be useful for all of us to look into this and see where, you know, we can take it as journalists to say this cannot happen and we cannot just stand by and see another country be managed or maybe the, the media being now managed in such a manner by the government of the day. I'll take a step back to the past elections. So this was in 2019. Um, it goes without saying that in those elections, we saw a very visible sponsored division in the media, unfortunately. Um, the truth was very subjective, depending on which uh, media house is publishing or broadcasting because uh, politicians, especially the government of the day, um, sponsored um, a lot of journalists. The brown envelope journalism that we speak of, um, which is a very really uncomfortable subject because uh, as it is currently, the, the environment is still tense because uh, journalists have almost turned against each other in a sense uh, on, you know, because of that. Uh, there's not, um, there, there isn't unity uh, per se because um, politicians have come in the middle and obviously they have managed to come into the middle or between uh, journalists into the fraternity simply because we allowed them in. So it is, it, it is quite a sad situation to have uh, witnessed in 2019 or the run up to the 2019 elections where the media was quite divisive and the truth was very, very subjective um, for the public. Now, one thing that's key to note about Botswana, ours is a very interesting one because, uh, okay, we speak about arrest. It's not as rampant or nowhere near as what the situation is in Zimbabwe. But I've, I've always said this on, on radio that, you know, in, in Botswana, you can have the freedom of speech, but your economic freedom cannot be guaranteed afterwards, meaning that it's very easy, given the size of the country, given the size of the economy, for the government to really pinch you where it hurts, and that's the pocket. They can completely shut you down economically. We've seen it happen to veteran journalists who have now come back, apologized to government, so that they can be able to, uh, you know, have a livelihood. So it's a very... Um, interesting situation because it's not aggressive, it doesn't involve physical harassment, but it hurt, it hits where it hurts the most, and that is the uh, the pocket. I I stopped working for my morning show about two months ago, and this had been a year and a half of almost getting into a hearing every day. You know, after saying one thing. You have to now uh, get into a hearing because this politician is not happy. Um, this uh, director, this you need to uh, uh, write an apology. You need to issue an apology on air. So this, you know, it's interesting to hear Hopeful speak about these things because it's the same um, in in a different manner, as I would say. It's not outright um, where you, one can see the harassment, but it's done in a very tidy manner, but very effective. So this is this has been the story of my life a year and a half um, of always being in hearings for one thing or the other. Uh, very interesting times. So now I liked uh, the part where Professor Tabani spoke about where he said that freedom is not free, because I think as as um, journalists, especially the up and coming ones, we are also guilty of that because we don't want to work uh, for our space. 
we expect to be given uh, our space or to just have the platform available to us. And we don't want to suffer for anything. Uh, we want to just um, work as we want, which um, then uh, leads to that issue of self censorship, where we just want to um, have a trouble free uh, work environment, which then obviously dilutes the purpose of um, what we are. So I think that um, in closing, in a sense, as, as the media, times are hard for us. In fact, I've got the, let me see, uh, Botswana's um, Press Freedom Index for 2022. Um, we are 95 out of 180 countries. And this reflects a drop of 57 positions um, in a year. Shows you how bad the situation is. I think that um, at the end of the day, uh, in as much as uh, you know, conditions are worsening for, for journalists across the world, the one part that we have control of and that we can take charge of is to close the door to being corruptible. Let's not contribute to the downward spiral of the fraternity. Professor Tavani spoke about it, said the spirit of incorruptibility. I think it's something that we should deeply introspect on as the media fraternity in my country. Um, uh, to my fellow journalists that, you know, um, everything else may be out, out of our control, but this one part that we have in our charge, we should really take care of and close out um, being corruptible and being divided as we are, because it doesn't help us in any way. With that, um, I'll say thank you again um, for your invitation. And I really, really hope that we will see more of this type of work and some more such platforms. I hope even from our end, uh, we should be able to also organize because having these conversations um, is really interesting to see that we're not, um, you know, working in a vacuum, we're not islands. Our problems are similar. And I think if we put our heads together, stand in solidarity, we can do a lot more. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for the invitation. Thank you so much, Buinello, for that uh, submission. And then I'm going to hand over to Mr. T, Mr. Tweu, a.k.a. Babaga Twitter Spaces. Uh, as you give your submission, please just briefly tell us uh, how Twitter Spaces came into being and how it functions and how you see it coexisting with traditional media platforms. Thank you so much, Wanes uh, Musidi. Uh, what an honor it is to be here with you. Um, uh, you know, with uh, family and Kobosa, very nice to be with you. I really appreciate and I feel blessed by your presence. Many thanks to, to Professor Tawani for uh, that amazing, uh, you know, uh, lecture he gave. I also want to thank the National Press uh, Club for, for organizing this. Uh, you know, many thanks to my panelists here, uh, the dignitaries that we have in the house, uh, as well as uh, the UNISA uh, community at large, um, and, you know, the rest of the people listening in from around the world, as I am. Uh, it's early here, Igu was saying, and I have to run uh, to take kids to school soon, so I'm not uh, going to... Uh, take too much time. I'll just, uh, you know, run through uh, some of the things uh, that I picked up today and my thoughts. And let me begin by just saying, you know, this is indeed a day to remember Ntate Koboza and he, his incredible work uh, that he's done, uh, leaving behind something for us uh, to pick up uh, and use uh, as we move along, some kind of a map uh, that can help guide us given his experiences so we don't have to run into the same pain uh, that he did. Uh, so I do appreciate this day of reflection and of course uh, most important of all, you know, um, our takes on the role of media uh, today, uh, particularly in South Africa. 
I think that, uh, you know, South Africa is divided right now and uh, our media should have a role in that, actually. You know, uh, media should indeed be sort of like our Desmond Tutu, you know, uh, the professor, uh, you know, said earlier on that, you know, there is indeed a need for, 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 for media, you know, to, to, to play that role of nation building. And I tend uh, to agree uh, with that, uh, a media that can help uh, build South Africa. You know, uh, from 94 to where we are, I think a lot of work still remains to be done in terms of building a nation that can work for all for all who live into it in it um there was a piece on the weekend uh, in iol by Ta and that they uh, you know dr tamima zwai uh, entitled uh, media must boldly become the voice of the people i don't know if you had a chance uh, to read it but it was a, a very good piece to read and i highly recommend it uh you know uh, that you read it in terms of uh, what the media uh, is doing right now in South Africa and what could be done to correct some of uh, the concerns he raises. We're now in a, you know, a world that's uh, moving quite fast um, and advancing, you know, uh, at, at quite a speed. Uh, but at the same time, we are becoming more polarized. Uh, you know, um, around the world. This isn't just in South Africa. I think, you know, even here in Canada, we are seeing a, a nation that's becoming more and more polarized. And I think that's where we, we need the media, uh, you know, the media's intervention so that, you know, the media can come in uh, and help, uh, you know, uh, these uh, address some of these divides we are seeing happening across the world. Uh, Dr. Tami warned, you know, of, uh, of uh, in his article over the weekend of uh, media houses, for instance, that are now, you know, uh, taking part um, or sides in South Africa's uh, factional battles uh, that uh, are happening. And I think, you know, the Premier did uh, 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 note that earlier on, as well as uh, uh, Professor Dabani. I think that is quite dangerous and the media has to really try and reclaim uh, its role within uh, South African society. Uh, and I would say this, you know, that um, with media freedom, you know, comes a responsibility and that is, you know, the responsibility, uh, responsibility to the to the public. Um, you know, South Africans can no longer trust the media now. And this is, you know, based I know I'm not in South Africa, I'm mostly, you know, on Twitter. Uh, but I also speak to people at home, and I'm picking this up uh, every day I speak with people at home that, you know, South Africans don't uh, trust the media, and uh, that is quite concerning, right? The media is being blamed of, you know, bias and, of course, this political factionalism uh, that I noted earlier on, uh, which, you know, has been identified as a, a major issue uh, that uh, people are seeing now, uh, you know, the media. Uh, taking a part in. So I think that's one thing that really needs uh, some uh, looking at, um, you know, as uh, as the media to see if uh, there are solutions there and if the media can indeed reclaim its role as Ndate Mazwai uh, noted on the weekend. We have so many pressing issues uh, deserving media coverage, you know, in South Africa. Uh, and uh, I've noticed that the media nowadays uh, focuses mostly on, you know, these political battles, these factions, and also, you know, trending topics uh, when we could really use, you know, uh, the media's coverage uh, to look um, at other things. And this is where, you know, I've tried to do my best, you know, with the little that I have to play a role uh, through Twitter spaces. Um, you know, uh, Twitter spaces, when they started over two years ago, they invited me as one of their testers, you know, um, uh, on this platform. So I sort of I joined them and worked with them as they built this platform and, you know, uh, became quite surprised in the interest that uh, South Africans took. Uh, in Twitter spaces. And here we are today, you know, Twitter spaces, uh, you know, a social audio platform that is uh, used by millions across the world daily. Our brother here, you know, Hopewell, uh, is also uh, a user of the platform and I've seen him use it uh, so effectively, you know, bringing Zimbabweans uh, online and using the platform as an alternative to, to, to media, certainly you know, in situations especially where there is, uh, you know, suppression 
So, you know, I, there is a bit of a promise there, you know, with people uh, now on Twitter spaces uh, because, you know, they see a need, a need for, you know, um, uh, average people's voices, especially to be heard, you know, for their everyday struggles uh, to be heard as well. Uh, you know, on Twitter spaces, anyone can break news, uh, you know, people can just come on and, and, and you know, just share uh, how they feel without being, you know, uh, censored or anything like that. So, you know, uh, this is uh, promising. It's really promising that, you know, we can touch on pressing issues on, on Twitter spaces and other similar social uh, audio uh, platforms uh, around the world. You know, people can now share, you know, on issues happening in their lives, in their communities in real time, and they're not censored, which is a good thing. Uh, this reflects, I think, you know, uh, the need for more uh, honest, uh, nonpartisan media and the need for, you know, journalists uh, who ask questions and report. Communities should not only be getting uh, coverage when there is uh, controversy. We need, you know, the journalism of Ntate Pesi Koba and uh, Mr. Mazwai uh, quite badly. Or the shift, I think, to alternative forms of uh, media such as uh, social audio, will become uh, a serious threat uh, to media houses and journalism. And that might not actually be a good thing either. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because, you know, you'll now have uh, conspiracy theorists uh, running uh, wild on social audio, right? Uh, and, you know, uh, getting high, very high numbers of listeners, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, uh, sharing in uh, misinformation and disinformation. So that, that's, that's a challenge there. And I think that's where we see, you know, uh, the need for, um, really the need for, for, for journalism still, you know, the good journalism uh, that, that uh, we really can use uh, in the world. You know, I think we should let the struggles of Bontate Pesi Koboza, you know, um, uh, to, to lead us, you know, they worked and taught us, uh, you know, um, how to do some of these things uh, so that we could have it better today. Uh, we are the change, I think, that, uh, you know, we've been waiting for and we should not uh, waste uh, on any of, of the time uh, that we have today. There are many pressing issues in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, and in Botswana, as Ausbune Buinello uh, has also uh, shared with us. Um, one warning I would share is that of, uh, you know, watching um, politicians uh, grip on power, you know, which is uh, just, you know, it keeps tightening. And, uh, you know, um, the Canadian journalists and academic uh, Michael Ignatieff uh, has spoken on this, uh, saying that, you know, democratically uh, elected leaders, you know, can turn author authoritarian. And, uh, you know, he says that they use democracy to crush democracy, you know, he, uh, that they get power and then they neutralize the media, they neutralize the courts, lock up dissenters, uh, shut off, you know, universities, uh, and then call themselves Democrats, uh, who, you know, who are doing these things, uh, such as, you know, the shutting off of democracy. That may be, uh, you know, he says that that may be the single most dangerous thing happening in the 21st century uh, right now. And uh, some of the warning signs that he has shared are uh, the passing of legislation, making it impossible for, for instance, for universities to operate freely, uh, you know, uh, or the suppression of the press, the declining uh, voter turnout, the gerrymandering or, you know, remapping of... Um, uh, electoral districts, for instance, you know, to favor certain political uh, parties or those in power, as well as the role of money uh, in, in politics. So I think these are things that we need uh, to watch for uh, in terms of, you know, what politicians are doing and how they are trying to, 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 to control uh, the media, uh, to capture, as some would say, the media. Finally, I would say, you know, uh, let's ask ourselves why, you know, for instance, the president of South Africa won't hold press conferences regularly, uh, as should be the case in a democracy. You know, President Ramaphosa will fly to Washington, you know, D.C. in America 
and uh, you know uh, have a press conference there. But then he comes back home, and there are no press conferences. They are dead. You know, uh, so I think that South Africans and the media need a lot more access to the president. Uh, he needs to account. You know, even in parliament, uh, the president uh, still hides behind the speaker. I think these are some of the, the things that the media needs to, to you know, call him out on. Uh, or if required, I think we might run into issues. But as reminded by uh, Meto Gozile, you know, um, there is no peace, um, uh, you know, um, and we cannot uh, really sleep at night until some of these issues um, are addressed. South Africa is full of, you know, talent and possibilities. I think that we need responsible black, you know, uh, activist journalism that uh, that Ekoboza and others like him, uh, you know, have brought us. Uh, I would say, you know, media, you have the power and you should use it. Use it for truth, uh, use it for nation building. And as Professor, you know, Tabani advised, you know, uh, media does have a role here in terms of nation building. And I strongly agree with him on that, uh, that, you know, the media does have the power. The media has got the power to stop Zimbabwe. Uh, Zimbabwe's uh, government's, you know, harassment of uh, Brother Hopewell, for instance. Uh, why not use that, right? Um, perhaps what could happen is, you know, uh, our media in, in South Africa can put pressure on our government, right? Or they can pan pieces, you know, and call out uh, the Zimbabwean government to stop what they're doing to a good brother here. So please, uh, we have the power, and I think we should... Uh, use it, you know, and as our brother Hopewell said, where is the outrage? We need outrage. Or, uh, you know, if, if we don't do that, then we, we are definitely going to to run into some serious trouble. So um, let me just uh, thank everyone for this opportunity uh, to be here. Uh, it has been an incredible uh, time uh, with uh, Amazing people, uh, you know, uh, here I have so many notes I've taken and uh, I heard the professor saying he's going to share uh, his address, which makes me happy because I, I'm actually um, putting together a course that I'll be teaching starting January. So I'm hoping that we'll be using his address, uh, you know, uh, as part of our, our readings uh, for this course. So thank you so much, everyone. It has been an incredible honor. Uh, much more work really remains to be done, and uh, let's keep at it. Um, South Africa needs a lot of work to be done, and our media can really turn things around for us. Uh, Musiri, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. T. I'm going to ask Crystal to also um, make her submission. I know she needs to run, so I hope you can still make the time. Okay. Um, thank you every mu very much. I think it's a difficult task when you last and you actually have to respond to some of it. Um, but thank you very much, um, Prof. JJ, that I've known all my life since um, South African Student Press Union days. Um, it was very illuminating that he could touch on so many issues that is so relevant and resonate to me. Um, of course, my colleagues um, from the region, thank you very much for your inputs. Um, so I'm standing right now because I'm, I'm a news editor. So on a daily basis, I have to face the challenges of a shrinking newsroom, um, retrenchments, misinformation, health, um, toxic working environment, mental health, um, self-censorship, and I constantly have to ask myself these questions every day. Um, and so with me, I have Gloria, who is an intern, um, you know, on her first story, um, because our newsroom... Our newsroom has shrunk. Um, there was COVID, um, there was just resignations, there was mental health. Um, and as much as I, I had a prepared um, you know, talk about solidarity, about neglect that we have, but I actually thought my colleagues raised that, let me talk about what my reality is on a daily basis. And thank you very much 
to UNISA, to the National Press Club, to the Kobosa family for this opportunity to simply just reflect the realities. Um, so as a news editor, I have to um, run a national newsroom for radio, which I feel is the medium for the masses because that's how we communicate to some person sitting in Soweto, sitting in Mitchell's Plain, sitting in Pochabello and tell that story. And so I'm confronted and I have to make decisions on an hourly basis of what do we cover, what is a priority, what, you know, does Sir, President Cyril Ramaphosa get a story because he's in Saudi Arabia, or do we actually tell the story of the six bodies found in the Joburg CBD that was just there for ever, and nobody found it? Who are these women that were killed by someone? Or do I send someone to court to cover um, the illegal Zama Zama kingpins that have caused absolute havoc in our communities, but that are driving 13 fancy luxury cars? Or do I send someone to the harbor where, you know, Satawu members are protesting for a living wage, and at the other hand, the farmers are saying, well, we cannot export um, our goods and services because it's stuck at the harbor and it means millions of rands will be wasted, jobs will be at play, and ultimately we, as uh, the people, will pay more for our goods and services. So, so what I'm saying is that not to paint a picture of, oh, you know, it's such a struggle. I feel privileged and honored that I can direct a newsroom, that I make the decision, that I'm conscious enough of the issues that JJ had mentioned, the challenges within the political sphere. Um, but I have to make those challenges because I want to tell a story to South Africans. I want them to understand that we have to have solidarity to our um, Zimbabwean brothers and sisters, not only to them, but also in Eswatini, where human rights violations are just happening, journalists are under fire. Also in Mozambique, where there's a conflict in the north of the country and where journalists simply can't even report. Um, and so how do we ensure solidarity, how do we tell the South African story, taking into account all the challenges. And Toko, I thought, um, you know, your, your point of um, your father would be disappointed of how some media sectors in South Africa are dividing South Africa. I think as a journalist, I am disappointed when I see the headlines on a daily basis and that the media actually want to be involved in factional battles. You know, that's really not our role. Our role, for me at least, because I was trained at the SABC, was to inform and educate the public to tell them the stories that they won't know and to expose atrocities, expose the fact that there is no water um, at some hospitals, expose the fact that money's being eaten um, to pay for skinny jeans at the expense of, you know, real services happening at, um, at hospitals. And so, yes, I'm going to hire interns because I'm going to be able to train them and I'm going to give Gloria the opportunity to tell the story of the Sowetan runner a mother, a grandmother who went on a run on a Sunday and didn't return because she was murdered. And that for me, we have to create opportunities for our younger generation to be able to tell the story because, you know, at some point, we have to train the next generation in media ethics, in ensuring uh, we tell the South African story and to be truthful. Um, and so, yes, I don't have all the answers. Um, there's a myriad of challenges in the media fraternity within newsrooms, that's a reality. But I think for me on a daily basis, the newsroom that I have a level of input, I'm going to try and direct and take into account the lessons learned from um, you know, what a generation before us did in the 1970s, in the 1980s, and try my utmost to inform, educate um, the public on um, public issues. And so on that note, um, thank you very much for this opportunity and for some reflection. Thank you so much, uh, Crystal. We really appreciate um, your time and input. We know you need to rush and uh, possibly report about the lecture as well. <laughs> Oh, okay, that's good to hear. I, I, I know that uh, it's been quite a long day, but uh, at this point in time, I'll invite questions from the audience, if we have any, or questions from our audience on, on our virtual platform. Just a few questions um, before we wrap up the session. 
You can go ahead, ma'am. So I was told you press and then a light will come on and that's when you start talking. Okay, I have a question for Professor Tabani. No. He's listening, eh? Okay. <laughs> so, um, given the state that um, journalism has deteriorated to in the country, is the pushback of its freedom being under attack not a fitting one? And I will expand on my departure point with this question. So, the media has become this regurgitative machine that reports on fluff pieces that they pick up on, on social media. Um, I think about three weeks ago, there was a journalist from IOL who published an article, uh, Jolene Mar Mariah Maharaj, on human trafficking. And the lady in question had actually posted a video because she's the one that you know experienced this encounter with the supposed human trafficker. And then she went on to report on this said story and provided information that was not what happened in the video. And now, um, the real stories that should be published by journalists don't seem to be getting the time of day. I'll also mention a story recently that was published about the four-year-old that went missing in Watville. And on Tuesday, I believe, the bail hearing in Benoni took place. And the angle of that story was more focused on the father, you know, attempting to accost the perpetrator. And very little mention in the story was given to the fact that the perpetrator had previously been arrested for raping another child in the same neighborhood. So no question is being posed by journalists as to why our justice system seems to have a one-size-fits-all response to criminal offenses, yet criminal offenses have varying degrees in severity. That's why you'll have a Schedule 1 offense and you'll have a Schedule 5 offense, yet they are all met with the same um, response. And I just wonder if... Um, you know, the pushback with the attack on the freedom of journalism is not a fitting one. That is my question. Yes. Um, <laughs> thank, thank you for the question. I, I think that the the idea of, of sort of doing introspection with the media is not to say in general there is total collapse and so on. I'll give you an example. In my research, because I really was worried about this issue about media appeals tribunal and whether or not it was justified one way or another. Then I, when I did the research on the type of cases that went to the press ombudsman, in fact, 60 to 70 percent were, 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 were sort of decided in favor of the media. In other words, people who went there, one out of, so seven out of 10 were wrong. The media was right to have reported that only three, uh, uh, if it were, we're talking 10 people, only three would have then uh, gotten an apology for the media. That said that even though there are mistakes, because remember the media is printing billions of words a day. Right? In South Africa alone, there are 30 newspapers. By the way, this may be an old statistic, because I finished my research long ago on that. But there may be about 30 newspapers, daily newspapers. You start counting the stars or where 10 cities, you get 30 dailies. Before you get to the ones that are online, blogs, and so on. So millions of words have been printed. So in comparison, if you look at the number of uh, uh, mistakes made and complaints about inaccurate reporting or bad reporting and whatever stuff that were going to be taken to the BCCSA or to uh, uh, to, to, to ombudsman. Actually, most of the time, the media gets it right. It's just that now, because of social media and so on, the things that the media gets wrong are more pronounced, right? 
So I, I don't want us to live here thinking, oh, the media is in such, it's so, so rotten, we can't believe anything. We just need to be vigilant. The same way that we are vigilant with government interfering, we need to be vigilant with media doing the wrong things I mentioned, toxic work environment and so on. Those things are not challenged. One of the problems in the media is a failure to challenge each other. When you challenge each, you know, your, your colleague, it, it's, it's like, you know, it's like this so-called boy code. You know, when, when they say you can't go out with somebody who your friend went out with. Even if you fall in love with the person, you must now stop yourself because your friend was there before. That's how the media behaves, you know. And the society actually expects that. You know, I'll give you an example. So I get home, you know, when I get home, when I do this shouting on TV and so on, and I've got lots of fans and people. At the home, it's all like that. They, when I arrive in the door, my wife says, why on earth would you say something like that on TV? Right? And one of the days I got a lashing was when I criticized a colleague, uh, uh, Stephen Hrotes, and I put him on the screen here and lambasted him and created and dedicated the rent to him. They said, this is unacceptable. How can you do that? Stephen is such a nice guy. You know, sorry, switched off. So what, so what if Stephen is a nice guy? If he says something outrageous, why must I spare only my criticism for Gwede Mandashi and not Stephen Hrotes, just because he's a colleague? There's no way. We, we, we've got to be able to then, the introspection will never happen. Uh, as you are saying, if that journalist reported wrong and so on, right, that must be a condemned so that others can learn from it. Right? So I hope I've tried to, to, to answer you to say, yes, there is a justifiable complaint about the media, but it's not as uh, 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 you know, out of control as the narrative has become. Because in terms of just, just pure statistics, of complaints given to the ombudsman, right? It doesn't say 90% of things that are printed in the media are, are, are nonsense, right? It actually finds that, yes, there are those who need to go and apologize, but the majority are just trying to do a good job, and they just happen to rub somebody the wrong way, and people somehow think that if you run to the ombudsman, you're gonna get better PR. In fact, it's a, it's a bad strategy. If you're a communicator, the well, last thing you want to do is, as they say, fight somebody who, who, who orders oil by the, by the barrel. Because remember, a newspaper comes out every day. So you can respond to them once. They can write about you every day for the next five days. Or if you have a TV show or radio show every day, you can talk about that person and make part one, part two, part three of him. You can respond every time to what the media is saying. Right? So it's a balance we need to strike. Introspection, yes. Right? But we must also understand that at the end of the day, we need to encourage journalists to, to do the right thing. They are not perfect. These are human beings trying to do a job. Uh, and half of them are actually not malicious. Uh, when I do media training for people, I always say, forget about the theory that media is hostile and what. That's not going to help your PR. Then some of them may be hostile. In fact, I, uh, was one of the things I skipped on my, on my, my paper here was, uh, I was I was running a workshop with the uh, cabinet of Limpopo government. And the doctor, Alex Mashiv, you must know him, he's a spokesperson of the Southern Communist Party, uh, was, was very uh, strong about the fact that there may not be a media agenda, in you know, other media as a collective, but there are agendas in the media. If you're talking about the, you know, a number of 3,000 or 4,000 journalists, which is roughly the big cohort of journalists, you can't tell me that amongst them there, there, must, there, there couldn't be some who are in a sense, agents or, 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 or rogue journalists and so on. Like in any profession, it would be priests. They're supposed to do certain good things, but they are bad. We hear, hear stories all the time about Same with journalists, same with professionals, same with communicators. What we need to do is to be able to know how to root those ones out who are giving the rest a bad name. I hope that helps. Okay, um, I'll go to... Antoinette, and then we have three more hands. Yeah, Antoinette, over to you. Um, Professor Tabani, I just want to get your view on the um, on President Ramaphosa's failure to take questions from uh, journalists ever, and what do you think? How should we, as media, respond to that? Look. Uh, President Raposa is, is a, actually a general, a sharp fan. I think that's, that's the first. Before I come to the bad advice, he's getting on PR. I think he's just a shy person. 
I'll tell you a, bit, a small story. So on January, uh, after the January 8th statement, usually the president gives media to interview him. Uh, they give 30, 20 minutes, 30 minutes to, to, to each TV channel, right? So I arrived at this thing. He didn't know I was coming because he's been refusing to come to my show forever. And he told me straight, he said, no, 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 no. You ask too many awkward questions. I'm not going to come uh, now. We'll come later. So now as I arrived, because now he didn't know who was coming from ENCA. And when he sees me, he said, oh my God, I didn't know you were going to be here. And he started looking for his iPad. You know, that famous iPad. <laughs> You know, uh, and then I realized, he realized there's no escape. Now I'm here in front of him. And in fact, we are first as ESCA to talk to him. So I talked to him for half an hour. And then when he's finished, he says, you know, sometimes when I listen to you, I think you are mad. I think you are mad. Uh, I said, no, no, I want to come. I need you for two hours, actually. The 20 minutes was not enough. He says, no, I'll come. This is January. It's now, I think it would be good to say it's November now. He has not bothered. It's 10 months. And I, with the Palapala thing, he will not even make it. <laughs> right? But he, he promised in January, don't I'll come. I see you've got new studios and so So part of it is that he's shy. Part, part is that he has bad advisors. For example, and bad advisors not in general, but on communications. Right? I mean, he had the acting spokesperson for more than two years as a president. Two years. He only had been a spokesperson about three or four months ago. Right? Um, so that already tells you. He had an acting chief of GCIS for eight years. That covered the Zuma nine ways that plus him, plus his ten. <laughs> right? So just between those two, it can show you that it doesn't necessarily take communication as a strategic thing and so on. Uh, there's somebody who mentioned, or was it a, or one of our, our panelists mentioned that he, he likes this thing of doing going abroad and doing a, a press conference there because he feels that those people want to ask him about the palapalas of this world because they may not have too many details, right? But when he's there, he's more comfortable. I mean, he, he, he did this in, in media. This one annoyed me greatly. So he gave a media, 20, a France 24, a full interview that we've been asking for, for from him since 2019. I got to, to interview him by accident on two occasions, like this particular one of January. And then when I was at Newsroom Africa, when we were launching, after he had refused, I bumped into him at the funeral. And then I said to him, President, just come and, you know, it will be a panel. Don't, it don't just be me, because apparently I also tend to be awkward, uh, awkward with these guys. So I said, no, no, there will be three of us. It will be a round table. It will be very nice. Please come, President. Then he went to the office and said, no, he says it's going to be fine. Let's go. And his team was saying, no, no, no. We know this guy. Once the lights are on, it's going to be bad. <laughs> what happened when we did that interview, and may, m many of you may remember it, because it's never happened in a country where the president is interrogated by three journalists at the same time in a close you know, show. It was meant to be an hour and a half. At 60 minutes, his security came to extract him from the studio. They told us, no, no, he has to leave now, guys. You, you must stop now. So he's, he's, there's a shyness about him. Uh, I believe that politicians sometimes surround themselves with people who tell them, no, you can't answer, and so on. But the media has to make a big stink about this. It mustn't be a choice that the same way he has to go to parliament once a quarter. We need to be able to, to, to make representation through SANEF, right, to say we want the president every quarter and it must be guaranteed that journalists can come and ask him questions and so But that's even a poor cousin of what he should be doing. He should be going around the country to three, three TV stations. I just suggested to uh, uh, the head of news at, at Newsroom, we were in a panel last week for, at Brands South Africa, and I said, why don't the three, three channels at 8 o'clock say to the president, we're going we're gonna to stop everything and you come and talk to all these three TV channels at the same time at 8 o'clock, right? And of course, the first answer was, no, 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 we are, we are competitors. No, we are not competitors. I'm beating you every night, so it's, it's OK. There's no competition. So just come. Well, there's three of us. We talk, me, Voyo, and, 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 and Tabu. We just interview the president together, and all the channels on him. You, can you imagine how much traction he'll make, how much how much he can be able to explain himself on many things. No, just part the palapala. But on all other things, economy, unemployment, corruption, etc. Right? So in summary, he's a shy person. Two, 
is receiving better advice. Three, SANEF hasn't made enough of a sting to demand. Uh, and some of his ministers are queuing from, or take a cue from him. Some of them, I mean, if you look at the Topodi Diza or uh, this guy from DTI, Patel, has never inter been in a serious interview for, for years. Because they, 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 he lives by example. They say, if he's not doing it, why must we do it? Um, I, I'll t okay, I'm, I'm guided that I should start here. Uh, please, can we keep our questions short? And if answers. there's a need to come back for a second round, we can do that. Thanks. And, and Prof said it with his own mouth yeah. that in the answers, it wasn't me. <laughs> so you just press the button on your right, there are two buttons. Hi, uh, this is Rokuyowa from Communication Science. Thank you, Prof, for a great lecture. My question is about social media mobs. Now, social media mobs against a journalist transgression or bias or mistake, do you think that they can be useful, alternative, useful alternatives, forms of media regulation, or do you feel that they further deteriorate media freedom? Thank you. Quick answer there, as I had said, uh, the, the whole idea of a media appeals tribunal was atrocious because it was based on a wrong premise, where they're saying, you know, this media is dragging the dignity of comrades and we're going to deal with them. So unfortunately, that has poisoned any discussion about regulation. That's why the media insists on, 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 on self-regulation. There was a whole commission led by, I think it was Judge Langa, that came up with even stronger self-regulation. I think for me that is... Uh, uh, adequate, right? Because you still have an option to go to court. If you think that really what there was being said is beyond just a media regulation issue, but a defamation issue, you know, like we ask come up with anything. If I said to him, you are corrupt, you try to get a master's before an honors, and you bribe the professor, <laughs> you know. And I was on thin line there because I didn't really have actual evidence other than that I read it in another media. And here he had not left to stand on because he must first sue the Sunday well because he didn't contradict them. So we say, according to the Sunday well. Right? So the social media thing, uh, if you remember what happened to Karima Brown, was terrible. Where he was dragged, she was dragged by the EFF and their supporters and threatening all kinds of fire and brimstone on her. I think that's unacceptable. Right? And I think that the, 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 the press ombudsman must find a way in which he can, he can deal with that kind of thing. Right? However, um, it, it's, it's, it's important to understand that there are other options. You can sue, you can go to legal aid. I mean, not everybody has money to, 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 to drag these politicians to court. Yeah, but often it's to respond to them because they would drag you to court first as a journalist. Like I've seen it, you know, people try to intimidating tactics uh, which will not work. Uh, at least with me, they won't work because I just repeat what I said after the court case. So, in summary, I think we must stay away from the issue of trying to add government regulation to the mid. Fourth estate must be independent, and it must not be intimidated by the fact that, like we, what you saw in the secrecy bill, you go, you go to jail for 25 years if you say something. No, that's not how to build each other, either. The journalists who make a mistake, how do we bail them not to repeat that mistake? Second, how do we have safeguards to make sure they don't think they can just get away with it uh, because it's their opinion? We, all, we must all be responsible, you know, uh, I mean, and that's also that's peer, what we call peer, uh, peer support is also important. Sometimes when I come to come and say certain things, my producer will say, no, but you cannot say that on air. And I have to find a way to, to, to make it better before I get on air. If I just went from, from my home straight into the studio, maybe I would have been fired again by many of these organizations. So it's a balance, right? Responsible reporting, but the public also be able to understand the role of the media and not try to complain and not try to complain about everything that's written about them and drag journalists for something that they, they, they are doing as their job. Thank you. Um, I think there's someone who has their mic on. I'm told we need to have one mic on at a time. 
So I'll, I'll hand over to uh, the gentleman there at the back. There was another hand on the side. And then you, oh, okay, one, two. Okay, so I'll start with him first, if it's okay, and then we'll move to the side. Thanks. Um, mine is not a question. Oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Pasika Parumil. I'm from the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology. Uh, mine is not a question per se. It's just a short comment on uh, something that Prof said, and I think it resonates a lot with what we've seen over the last few years in media. And that is something that is somewhat stressful for me because uh, I think I've noticed this 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 pattern of people uh, reporting from a point of view of opinion more than a point of view of facts. And that is what is fundamentally problematic with us at this point in time, because if a media house is reporting from a point of opinion, that means that it's reporting from a point of bias. When in reality, we're finding ourselves in a, in a, in a somewhat awkward position, because once a media house is compromised, then the system itself will collapse because you need media with ethics and integrity. And when we have media which has no uh, ethics and integrity, then the system cannot be held into account by anyone. Once the media collapses, as we saw with uh, uh, Mr. Chunon, I think, uh, indicating in what is happening in Zimbabwe, because if there was a media which was able to be to to hold account uh, to account, sorry, to hold to account the government, then we would actually have a different way. Uh, forward from where we are. So, as I said, uh, mine is more of a of a comment, uh, not much of a question. And 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 also another point that I was thinking about in terms of integrity of what is media and what is being uh, uh, reported is there's this story which made me uh, very uncomfortable. There was a story on the Timbisa Ten, and I think just that story in itself should be a case study for why it's necessary for us to have a media which holds integrity because if you can go and say that that means that you can influence because the media has such a big influence on how people think and how people see the world if you do not have integrity in a sense that you can report on anything that you that you want to report on then you know that means that people will are bound to think in the way that you have advert oh, not advertised the way that you've said things and i'm sorry i'm rambling on now but that's just what i wanted to touch on i thank you Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to. Oh, okay. Um, um, yeah, I hope it's good afternoon. Now. Um, so um, I want to take it a bit of a flashback because of time. I, I was hoping to play an old clip. Uh, it will probably give my professor, the Prof Charlie, a bit of a heart attack because in 2020, uh, as Comsa. We did something, and <laughs> he was very unhappy with us, um, which was um, we actively went to the SABC to protest. Um, why I'm bringing that up was, at the time, uh, which is why I'm still wondering why she's the government administrator, Stelanda Beni, was just failing, and there was retrenchments that were happening within the department, or, or I mean, the, the SABC. And, as rightly as it had been put, uh, there was a shrink there's a shrinking newsroom. And another part of the shrinking newsroom is that young people such as myself who are in communication, who are journalists and so forth, are losing more and more opportunities in institutions that have a track record um, that should be providing employment. Something that Namibian uh, lady just uh, touched on is that they've hit, they, 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 they the, the media is being hit at the pocket because opportunities and um, basically um, security, job security for uh, journalists, and especially up and coming journalists, is, 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 is becoming a lot more scarce. Now, where am I going with this? Is that the ANC Youth League leadership at the time, led by Klan Kimo Hale, um, took over the campaign from us. They basically used it for their own political. Games. I love the rant that you did on Stella during that 2020 situation. What happens when political institutions claim to be in solidarity with the media and will fight for security of jobs? As we know, jobs were lost at the SABC and jobs are still being lost at the SABC even now. 
saying that we will ensure that press freedom is there, but then behave in the opposite manner. And I'm still suspecting maybe there were some other brown envelopes that happened to, after they took over the campaign to silence them as well. So it's a case of we are facing a losing battle in terms of security for communicators, journalists in the space, mainly because uh, we don't have a sense of value for integrity and the growth of the space. I hope I'm making sense there. <laughs> I'll take one more. Um, I think we can take one more. Please, may I humbly request again that we keep our questions short. Mm -hmm. We are standing between lunch, and I know a lot of people also need to leave. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is No. Put, put the microphone. Thanks. No, thank you very much. My name is uh, Tabu. My name is Mike. And my question is directed straight to Hotman OJJ which is a view that has been there in the media mainstream that it seems like there is an outcry within the media mainstream that is an onslaught on a journalist in this country. And this is reaffirmed by the recent case of uh, Jacob Zuma and uh, that uh, white lady of a journalist. Are you of a same view, uh, Hotman JJ, that indeed uh, this particular stance in particular by former president Jacob Zuma is somehow a violation to this uh, journalist. To what standard now to people in society should they then uh, critique journalists? Because it seems like there is this schizophrenia in society and you know these sensibilities on journalists not being critiqued and you know decisive actions being taken unto them. But I was more interested on the view of uh, UJJ on the case of uh, this uh, white journalist and uh, Jacob Zoom that what are his sentiment? Is he of the very same sentiment that, that is, you know, violating people within the media mainstream? Thank you very much. Um, sorry, President Zuma is simply being consistent with what he did when he was president. I, I mentioned that he dragged cartoonists to go. I mean, imagine. I'm sure he's the only person ever in this country who sued a cartoonist for a cartoon. Because a cartoon by nature is satire. In other words, you've got to laugh, not, not be angry because you're a cartoon in a particular way. Because it's meant to trick, it's meant to provoke, it's meant to, to cause outrage by its very nature. That's, that's why there's a cartoon in every, every newspaper. Right? So to sue that person, you, know, you are just going to lose. I've just read what the BCCA has said, especially if you're a public figure. But our politicians seem not to understand that. Right. They, don't, they, they seem not to understand that as a matter of course, they must be criticized. Right? So Jacob Zuma, President Zuma is a public figure. Uh, even if he's no longer in office, he still, we still pay for him, you and I, and with those VIP 10 cars that follow him and what have you, we pay for him. So he must understand that we will have to know every day of his privacy, unfortunately. Is suspended. Once you're a politician, you're probably suspended. If you do something strange, even at home, we will get to know about it. Right? But to say that journalists are under siege, no, no, that's, that will be an exaggeration. A lot of us go around our, our business without anybody bothering us. And when, when politicians take us to BCCSA, it's also their right to go there and complain. In my case, I was saying I've been there for about five times here last year, one or other cases, because Frankly, I'm not doing anything extraordinary. I'm just saying, here I'm competent, I tell them. Uh, and I tell them also in their face, by the way. It's not like I tell them on TV and I don't, when I meet them. Like two last nights, I met him at a restaurant in Cape Town, on the stairs there, and I say, hey, Chief, how are you? Let's have, let's have dinner. 
but this is after I insulted him the previous week on the, on, on the team. Because I understand I'm doing a job. I'm not there it's because personally I hate him. Actually, some of them are my friends from university. I mean, we are of this world. We went to school with these guys. Uh, when they have a title in front of their name, doesn't mean they are now become untouchable. So that's the first thing. So there's no, there's no siege of journalists. Uh, there are a couple of people who misunderstand that relationship between media mm -hmm. and the, the government. That it, it, it must have the necessary tension, but it must be mutually respectful. Because some of us cross, some of us would, with government communicators are now in the media. Some media are now government communicators. So you can't be arrogant because you're going to come across these people at some point. So that's the first test. On the second question that was asked, I, 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 I completely sympathize with the issue about job security. If you think about it carefully, it's not unique to journalism. It's just that the media, as I had mentioned, are able to get away with toxic work environments. I don't know why. You know? Um, I, I was fired without a hearing at one radio station, which I've now sued successfully. But it was because I realized that what happens is that because of the insecure contract you have, when you are fired, often you want to go to your next job very quickly because otherwise you'll be in the streets, right? And so if you sue, the next employer says, hey, this person is too litigious. I'm not going to hire them. That's why media gets away with it. Unfortunately for the station that fired me, I wasn't looking for a job. The media thing is not a job for me. It's a hobby. So frankly, I would sue. Even if I'm going to the next person, I'm still suing this one who sued me. It will help me, my wife will be able to go to shopping abroad because they made a mistake of thinking that if you are a, 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 a what do you call a independent contractor, you don't have rights. You actually have rights. It says in their contract, and, and other than the numbers going down, you cannot fire a person without a hearing. It says that in big letters, it's a, a section that is in bold. So you, if you read your contract, you realize that no matter how bad the contract is, when they want to let you go, they have to go through the process of Section 189. If you're a full-time employee, if you're a contractor, they need to have a proper hearing and give you a chance to correct whatever they say you have done to, 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 uh, no, to do to go against the con their contract or whatever. Right? So I sympathize with, the, with that issue very, very much. That my contract looks very bad, as soon as we speak now. They can fire me tomorrow. That's why I always say I consider my every show my last one. That way I don't have to worry about what I'm saying there. I just say my mind. If you want to fire me for this, that's fine. Right? Uh, it's not unique to the media industry. Uh, you know, you look towards a lot of story about what the SABC did and retrenchments. It happens everywhere. That's why the, high, the, the unemployment is so high. So we can't necessarily help the media in, in isolation from the rest of the economy. On, on, on those, but you need to know you've got the rights as a media practitioner, media. Just read your contract, you see. The last question about opinion. I sympathize with you again. However, a media, like a newspaper, let's take a newspaper as an example, is a combination of reportage on facts and reportage, if you want to call it that, or, or, or on opinion. Right? So it gives a platform of both factual reporting and opinion and something in between in what you call perspective or vintage point, right? That's why they're saying the objectivist doesn't exist because every journalist has their own sort of framework of what they think. And then when the news come, they report with that anger. You can't, you can't avoid that. You can't avoid that otherwise it would, be, uh, it would be a very difficult newspaper to read because it, it, it's written by somebody who doesn't understand the context. That's why it's difficult to be a journalist and then go and work in, a, in another country where you don't know head from tail. The South Africans can tell the best South African story because they've got the South African context. Right? Quick anecdote. I, I walked out, I was, I was, I'd gone to consult my lawyers about something, and then I, when I got out of the, the chambers, I met three people who are from a board. I don't know what, the, I don't remember the, the board that bought that uh, produced to set top boxes or whatever. The public protector has found that they were corrupt. I wrote an article in the Sunday Times, I had a column then, that used that public protector's report to, to, to say these people are corrupt, they must go, 
the usual renting, but this time it wasn't the right thing. So these guys met me and they said, we have a gun in our, our bag, we're going to shoot you. How can you not call us before you wrote about us? I said, no, I don't have to call you. But they, this is the context that they, are, they have a gun in their head. I don't know, you can put the gun away. Let me explain how it works. I'm not a journalist. I know it frustrates people when I say that. I'm not a journalist. I'm an opinion maker. The media just gave me a platform to say my opinion. So I don't have to talk to you. You know, when the public report uh, protector says you are innocent, I can write another piece if I like. But frankly, I just have an opinion. You can respond to the opinion. But, but please, put your gun away because I didn't do anything wrong. I just did, uh, put, did an opinion piece. It's the same with TV. I'm not a journalist reporting. Or, no, no, I, I've had, yeah, if you like, it's an opinion piece on air. So I'm there about opinion. Opinion always must be based on facts. Sometimes I could get it wrong. Sometimes I could get it right. But I, I frankly, uh, 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 not going to try and balance every sentence I, I, I say because it's not my job. My colleagues who are doing a very good job in their own shows have to report, have to balance all the time. But an opinion is an opinion. You, you say your opinion, and other people can respond. You have a right to reply. Right? So please understand that there's a combination of opinion and facts to make a media, uh, if you like, uh, a product to be interesting, otherwise it will be boring. Okay. Unfortunately, in the interest of time, uh, we need to wrap up and release some of our panelists who have to rush to other engagements. So before I wrap up, I'm going to ask Hopewell, um, Mr. Tweu, and Buinello, please, uh, if you can just uh, give closing remarks in less than a minute, please. Uh, I'll start with Hopewell. Mr. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, okay. And, uh, <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much uh, for first inviting me and for this um, useful and very meaningful discussion. I hope uh, it opens uh, gates for more discussions uh, around the media and around how we interact with uh, public officials. Uh, as uh, Professor JJ said, it's important for public officials to understand that once they are in that public uh, arena, they are going to be interrogated. Their actions are going to be interrogated and tough questions should be asked. And I think for a lot of uh, young journalists who are listening to this, uh, especially from countries like Zimbabwe, you should not despair. The little that is happening today, we are building bridges for a better tomorrow. Look at South Africa, people like uh, uh, Big Brother Percy, uh, Nat Nakasa, they had to persevere, but uh, they built a better future that South Africans and the South African media is enjoying today. So thank you so much for inviting me, and uh, it was a pleasure listening to the prof. Uh, to you. Thanks, Mutsidi. Um, thank you so much. I'm sorry, Tuto is right next to me getting ready to go to school. But I just want to thank everyone. This has been amazing. Uh, a quick point. Um, you know, on President Cyril Ramaphosa uh, not doing uh, press conferences, uh, that's unfortunate, and I do agree with the prof. I mean, you know, the president is such a charmer boy. I mean, imagine that smile, that big smile of his, and just hanging out with journalists, you know. So, I mean, the advice is getting there, I think, is just uh, not good, you know. And um, by law, too, I think the, the public protector has said, you know, a number of times that our ministers and our president uh, do have to speak uh, with citizens uh, and the media. So I think uh, we need uh, definitely need some pressure there. On President Zuma, um, you know, I think he has been, you know, unfairly targeted by certain people in the media space, but others uh, do so also strategically, you know, because Zuma is a name that will bring attention. I mean, I can open a space right now on President Zuma and have thousands of people. 
If I open a space on President Ramaphosa, I'll probably have a few hundred. If I open a space on, you know, ESCOM and water issues, same thing, a few hundred. So I think, you know, there is um, some issues there uh, with President Zuma. I mean, of course, he, as the professor said, he does need to account, but I think there is some unfairness and, of course, issues of racism also that uh, deserve some serious, uh, you know, uh, attention. Uh, in the media as well. Um, yeah, let me just quickly say, you know, thanks to 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 uh, uh, the Koboza family. Really appreciate you being with us here. And uh, I'll repeat these words as uh, I'm uh, Tokozile saying, you know what, uh, let's not sleep at night if there's no peace. Uh, there is no peace and I think no time uh, for sleep as well. Um, uh, the premier said something important uh, that you know government presence is needed and that also government does need to learn and accept uh, criticism uh, i think that uh, there is a lot uh, of uh, you know um, work to be done there uh, our government officials aren't uh, very good at taking criticism so we could really grow there uh, huge thanks uh, to 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 my co-panelists uh, Really appreciate being here with you today and uh, to the audience and everyone that is uh, here with us. Thank you so much. And I wish you all a very beautiful, warm day in South Africa. This site is very cold. So thanks, Musidi, uh, for putting this incredible event together, my sister. And then, um, last but not least, uh, we need, oh, lovely to see you with the kids there, Mr. Tsu. <laughs> uh, um, Buinello, your last, um, your, your parting shot. Okay, thank, thank you so, so much. much. Um, um, I, I, I am truly grateful, grateful um, you know, for, for having been included, included for this discussion. It's been such a refreshing, refreshing morning, or into the afternoon as well. I, I think, um, you know, for the media, it's interesting times ahead. There's so much that's going on, so many new pieces. But I still um, but I trust that it's on us to really fight, you know, for our space. Nobody in any, in any um, situation where oppression is involved, uh, will freedom ever be handed, you know. It's up to us to also um, ensure that we fight for our space and keep our eyes on the ball. Um, I'm, I'm really happy about you know, today's discussion, and I hope that to see more of these um, on our end as well as I hope that we can also one day be inviting you to the same, um, and also even including uh, those who need to hear this. You know, I always say, like, for instance, um, when we have women's conferences and the like, that if it's just us women talking about our challenges and problems, those people who are the ones who are perpetrators don't hear, don't get to understand. Um, you know, the impact of that action. So we also need to open up the discussions and have um, the, these people that we've been talking about also be um, a part of the panel, a part of, you know, uh, the audience to also, you know, understand our perspective. But, you know, all in all, thank you so much. It's been such a great honor and so insightful. And uh, my regards, I can't say I'm afraid of um, saying the same thing wrong. But uh, as a normal family, <laughs> thank you so much um, for, you know, continuing this legacy. It's only through you that we are here today. Um, and thank you so much um, to you, Musidi, as well, um, for facilitating for my presence on the panel. Um, I'm truly grateful and look forward to more of these. Um, have a lovely day. Um, I'm in Kaburone and I hope um, you have a good one in South Africa and all over the world. <laughs> Thank you, Buinelo, Balula, Palaha, Koboza, Balebo. And then uh, at this point in time, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, we know every good thing does come to an end. It's been a long day, but very insightful, very engaging, and I hope you gained something out of uh, this lecture. Um, I'm going to call upon to the podium our last speaker to do uh, the conclusion and vote of thanks uh, by Mrs. Khanya Mathare, who's the executive director for the Department of Institutional Advancement at UNISA. Mayor Mathare, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 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 Thank you, Mr
Thank you so much for really spending this whole day with us. Let's give ourselves a round of applause. And I'm going to break all protocol in thanking people. I'm going to start with the project team that was organizing, please. May we have them standing up and let's give them also our round of applause. May you all stand up. For us, it becomes easier when we come and pull our suitcases and sit down and start talking. But they've been behind closed doors. I mean, I'm even sorry, the city must also stand. Let me see. <laughs> sorry? Thank you, thank you. Uh, for us as Unicians, this is about Engage Scholarship. Before today, I went to 2020 and looked at the topic and I just saw the relevance in what is taking place today in today's lecture and what took place then. Because the theme for 2020, it was why journalism matters. The challenges have changed, but has its core purpose changed? And then the takeout or the key message there was that proper journalism must be about account accountability it must be about verification and about respect for the truth. But everything that was being said today, it was still evolving around there. So, Ndate, or Prof. Onkhupuzi, JJ Itawan, we're just used to calling you JJ. So, thank you very much because you've handled this theme very, very well about the media freedom in the light of what is happening. We've seen in the index itself that you brought an analysis to, where you took us through the various presidents, and you, we are encouraged to go and read what we have contributed to our knowledge uh, systems within, I mean, within the world. I wouldn't say within UNISA or within whichever institution you went to. So let me also appreciate you, Prof. Siasanga Jali. You did us very proud in opening and welcoming everybody today. And really, you also highlighted how important the Koboza family is and how they've contributed to the media freedom. And then, May Antoinette Slabert, we come a long way in me knowing you. Uh, this is the chairperson of the National Press Club. I think our agreement, we need to go revisit, but Thank you so much. I think we're challenged around that. What by uh, the the by and you said by Panyasa, by the premier in saying we need maybe to have a look, and even our main guest speaker into what are the things that we are really addressing and we should be addressing or this community should be addressing, and thank you for giving us really this overview about the professor Kobe about. Percy, I'm calling him a professor now, about Percy Koboza legacy and the Black Wednesday itself. And we know what uh, Percy Koboza went through and his determination and continued engagement in the profession itself. You've kept that alive. And then to the Koboza family, thank you really for being with us and especially to you, Togozile, thank you for standing up and thank you for sharing the Koboza name and allowing us to talk about it. Popia, hey, we are so afraid these days. Before you mention somebody's name, we must now consult, we must do so many things. But thank you for allowing us to talk about your father. The bravery of your father displayed uh, how he really used the pen to fight the battles of the day, the battles we still have even today. You reminded us in your speech that 2022, the 2022 index tells us to guard this freedom jealously. So let us take heed. And then from the premier himself, I think he touched really on something quite critical as well. And I now understand why his office ran, runs the way it runs in terms of the media space. He was the spokesperson, I didn't know that. 
So the takeout from his message really is whether the media is informing us or are they taking a different posture in supporting the politics of the day. So it's a challenge again. But he stressed the importance of the independence that must always be seen in the media people. And then I think I've sort of touched on what uh, Professor Tabane touched on, but I must just continue to say we will rely on you. We know your work, even at the SBL, Prof Tabane. But some of the things that you talked about was the very same threat of the media being a threat to sort of its own freedom. So let's challenge ourselves there to say, what is it that we are going to do? So I wish to thank you for bringing that up and the difficulty in defending the freedom because of toxic environments. It's not only in the media space. I think we see this in different organizations as well. So for media people, we are saying, but there has to be solutions. So in thanking you, raising those things up, I think you want to say, challenge yourselves, get solutions around that. Discussions, thank you so much from those joining us from very, very, uh, from afar and also close by. I think it was an eye opener. For us, the issues around victimization are also, uh, we are supposed to take care of them and the media needs to stand together as the media fraternity. Program director, I will end with you. Thank you so much for facilitating today. And as a university, I think our students, I want to thank you as well for being present today because this is about the engagement. And we usually feel as a university that we are being challenged in the social media spaces. But we want to know how to utilize the media space, the social media space in educating the communities. This is where the challenge is. And I think my professor over there will agree with me to say the students are there, so we have to follow them where they are, but now in delivering education. Thank you so much. When I heard Memathlari refer to Ndade uh, Pesikoboza as professor, I knew that it was my cue uh, to possibly put up my hand and say, uh, it's not a bad idea to confer an honorary doctorate to the program director. <laughs> With uh, those few words, let me just remind you that uh, we did touch on a whole range of issues. Uh, but in doing so as well, we, 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 show, we shown spotlight on media's own goals because oftentimes we are accused that we are not objective when debating issues around media and media freedom. Um, I just want to quote something that I picked up uh, in preparation for this lecture, which also touches on what Prof. Tabani touched on, that trust is a relationship and not a fact. More than anything, journalists need to hold firmly to the ethical standards that tell audiences their work is reliable and credible. This is what will ensure trustworthy journalism stands out from the noise around it. Thank you so much to everyone that attended and participated even virtually. Uh, from here on, it's lunchtime. And uh, please follow our, I don't see Nziki over there, but I think she's just outside the door. Oh over there. They will guide us to where we need to um, have our refreshments. And thank you to UNISA for providing uh, the refreshments. Thank you to everyone that participated. And as we celebrate Media Freedom Day today, or Black Wednesday, true to what we stand for as a press club, let's make sure that it never happens again. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>